so uh, this meeting is being recorded and um, uh, and uh, everything's kind of uh, logged in here so you can chat with one another if you want to but uh, try to make sure you are sending your chat message to the person you're you're directing it to you can ask questions that'll be the kind of way we we do questions we can't keep the mics open for everyone but um, uh, but we can uh, allow take take questions in the chat box so if you have a question just type it in and then we'll try to get to that as the speaker ends their talk or during the breaks and right after the meeting so um, uh, also if you're here and uh, are looking to get uh, continuing forestry education credits we have uh, two and a half credits uh, assigned to these meetings and um, and by the way if you didn't see that fourth meeting come through there is a fourth meeting uh, in early may and uh, we have uh, some pretty interesting speakers there too so um, so check that out. Uh, so, uh, so if you're interested in the CFEs uh, after the meeting, uh, just uh, fire me off an email with your RPF number and your SAF number, and we'll ch check that against the uh, against the attendance records. Uh, another uh, couple shout outs to our tree farm inspectors. If you've been trained on inspections and have been um, uh, working with us, and uh, we have three new uh, tree farms in the state, so we're very happy about that. And um, uh, and also our tree farm committee uh, meets every uh, quarter and uh, appreciate all their efforts uh, in what they've been doing recently. So uh, without further ado, I am going to ask uh, Matt to, uh, Matt Everly uh, from the Natural Resource Conservation Service. He's our partnership biologist and, uh, uh, and stationed down in Summersville, I believe. And he's gonna tell us, uh, give us an update on their warbler projects. So Matt. All right. Um, let's see. Here. All right. Hopefully, everyone can see that and hear me. Um, so as Dave said, I am Matt Aberly. I am a partner biologist with the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service in the West Virginia Division of Natural Resources. Um, and I'm gonna give you an overview of our forest management for cerulean warblers and golden winged warblers. So just kind of a quick overview of what I'm gonna be going through with you all today. Uh, I'm gonna give you a little bit of information about the background and population trends for these two warbler species, uh, go over the life history and habitat requirements for them, and also the management action that we tend to do on these potential breeding grounds, and uh, some steps that you can take to get involved if you're interested in participating. So two of 29 warbler species that we have in West Virginia are the cerulean warbler, which is this uh, beautiful little blue bird here, and the golden wing warbler. Um, they are small territorial eat insects. Um, they, uh, whoops, sorry. Uh, <laughs> they um, are in decline um, throughout North America and their range down into Central and South America. Um, they're some of the more sought after species for birders in the state. Um, they are relatively hard to find compared to other species, cerulean warblers, because they tend to hang out really high up in canopy tops, so they can be difficult to spot. And uh, golden winged warblers, because they're pretty secretive and like to hide in shrub. Um, so here I have a couple of range maps for both species, cerulean warbler on the left, golden winged warbler on the right. Um, as you can see, um, West Virginia is kind of a hot spot for both of these species with that um, reddish orange color. Um, they both breed in our state and um, throughout the region. Um, as you can see, West Virginia is kind of an important area for them both. Um, yeah. Here I have a couple of maps that show um, data from the Breeding Bird Survey, which is a, a big effort that 
is undertaken every year between Canada, the United States, and Mexico, just kind of cataloging all of the different breeding bird species throughout all those countries. Um, so you can see we kind of have these heat maps here. So you can really see why West Virginia is important for both of these species, um, especially the cerulean warbler. Um, it's estimated that uh, about one third of the cerulean warbler population actually breeds in West Virginia. So it's very uh, vital habitat for that species. And then uh, for the golden wing warbler, they, uh, they nest a lot in the upper Midwest, but as far as the Appalachian population, uh, West Virginia is uh, central and very important for that population. Here um, is some more maps I'm going to show you that it's also based on breeding bird survey data. Um, you can see it's uh, population trend maps. So the red shows decline in the population as a percent change by year and uh, blue shows an increase. So you can see throughout most of the breeding range for the cerulean warbler, there's been sharp declines um, over the last few decades. There is uh, some growth up in the Northeast, but even lately in the last few years, those numbers have started to reverse as well. So you can see since the 70s, there's been about a 69% loss of the cerulean warbler population. So they're definitely threatened. Uh, the golden wing warbler, we see a similar trend, um, especially throughout the Appalachian region. It's just universal declines there. A little bit of growth in the Great Lakes areas, um, but for that species, over a similar time period, um, it's been a 99% loss. So they're really imperiled here. So researchers and conservationists um, have knowledge of declines for both of these species, thanks to data from the Breeding Bird Survey over the last few decades. But for a while, there was not enough information to connect those declines to what was actually causing them. So there is a couple of um, working groups, the Cerulean Warbler Technical Group and the Golden Wing Warbler Working Group that uh, did some research projects to try and suss out those um, factors that are leading to these large declines. And uh, the result of all those, all that research were uh, management guidelines for both the cerulean warbler and the golden wing warbler. Um, so one thing before I talk about um, individually what these species require. Um, one important thing to point out is that an important characteristic, characteristic that both species require is a heavily forested landscape, uh, more than 75% forested within a five mile radius of a breeding territory. Um, so you can see why having such an important factor um, can be tough for these birds to maintain these days with so much habitat loss. So quickly, you just go over um, some of the management of Appalachian forests. Um, some of you may or may not be familiar with this, so I'll keep it brief. Um, throughout much of our state, we have what we call a mature second growth forest. So it's a lot of even age stands that lack large canopy gaps and structural complexity. And because of that, there is a lack of understory, um, which doesn't make for the best wildlife habitat. There's also been large declines in natural disturbances due to things like fire suppression. Um, so that prevents the development of um, early successional habitat, which um, is especially important for the golden wing warbler. And poor forest management, such as um, high grade timber harvests, which take some of the larger trees um, that are uh, beneficial for wildlife um, has led to a decline in suitable um, nesting sites for cerulean warblers. And, but uh, this provides an opportunity for management as 70 to 75% of the populations of both, both of these species are estimated to occur on private lands in West Virginia we can work one-on-one -on -one with landowners to improve their property to um, regain some of that complexity and canopy gaps. So as you can see on the right there, 
we have a picture of a kind of a typical forest that you might have on private land here. And on the bottom, you have the what it could potentially look like after we do some of this management that I'm going to tell you all about. Uh, wildlife has a um, lot of use for different stages of uh, um, regeneration vegetation. So on the bottom there, you can see the numbers that indicates the number of years after a clear cut. Um, so early on, uh, we have that early successional habitat. It was more shrubby and grassy. Um, that really benefits species such as the golden wing warbler, but also other birds that are imperiled like the American woodcock and the Eastern whippoorwill, which have also declined precipitously in the last few decades. And then uh, as the forest regeneration for, uh, goes a little further along, it benefits uh, species such as the rough grouse. And at the very end, when you get the really more mature stands, that's where the cerulean warbler tends to thrive. And all throughout these stages, um, the white-tailed deer make do. So going over a little bit of the uh, life history and habitat requirements for the cerulean warbler, they uh, require deciduous forests that are mainly comprised of oak hickory. Um, they really prefer to nest along ridge tops and upper slopes, and they prefer um, slopes that are either on north or east facing aspects. And as I alluded to before, they really um, require what we call a complex forest structure. So they like to have a lot of larger trees that are greater than 16 inches uh, diameter at breast height. And they like canopy gaps a lot. And they actually do prefer to have some grapevines around. I know we don't always prefer that, but it really benefits the warbler. So here we have an image that shows kind of typically where a cerulean warbler might build its nest. And then you can see a picture of the typical nest on the left there. Um, they tend to build an open cup nest on a horizontal branch, kind of on the edge of one of those canopy gaps. Um, as I mentioned, they like grapevine. They'll actually peel off some of that grapevine bark and use it to construct their nest. And another important thing for the cerulean warbler is that they have either young forest or heavy understory nearby. Um, this is important for the fledglings. Once they leave the nest, they tend to go down from the canopy tops to that younger forest and heavy understory where they take shelter there. I'm going to go uh, quickly through a little bit of the science behind the management. This was part of the um, research that started those management guidelines. Um, so here we have a patch of forest um, in the middle area. Um, that's kind of the focal area for where management was done. And then we kind of have buffers on the top and bottom parts of that blue outline. So is before treatment, um, you can see these kind of pink loops. Those represent uh, um, territories of individual male cerulean warblers. Um, they tend to be pretty territorial. And um, so this shows kind of how, uh, how many birds there were before the treatment. Then after the first year of treatment, the forest kind of would look how it does in that picture in the bottom right. You can see there's still some, uh, a few birds around. They're kind of more in those buffer areas. But a year after that, there's a lot more cerulean warblers around and they're in that kind of more focal area as well as the buffer zones. And a year after that, we still have even more territories. They're still um, using that newly developed habitat. And then in the fourth year post-treatment, 
you can really see that it's kind of exploded with cerulean warblers. So even just a few acres of um, management in an area can really go a long way. So the culmination of all this cerulean warbler research um, led to the cerulean warbler partnership. So it was between the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service and um, the Regional Conservation Partnership Program that they run. So they have partnered with the West Virginia Division of Natural Resources. Um, so that's why I'm a partner biologist because I'm uh, working both with the NRCS and the West Virginia DNR. And they have partnered with other groups such as West Virginia Division of Forestry um, and the Appalachian Mountains Joint Venture, which is part of the American Bird Conservancy. So it's a five-year multi-state project, um, covers about 12,500 acres of forest management in Maryland, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia, and 1,000 acres of mine land reforestation in Kentucky and Ohio. There's 21 plus partner organizations between all those states and over $16 million in funding. Um, this isn't the most up-to-date information, but it's just a snapshot of kind of the um, acreage acreages that have been enrolled in this program between the five states. So you can see there's a lot in Pennsylvania and then West Virginia is, um, uh, has a lot of its own. Yeah, you can see uh, it's kind of some of that mine land that's being reconstituted and uh, forest land there. So within West Virginia, there is uh, certain priority areas for management for the cerulean warbler. Uh, they tend to occur more often in the more western and southern parts of the state and uh, a little bit into the northern part of the state as well. Um, so it's really the counties in blue there are the ones we tend to focus on. Um, and give priority to. As you can see on the right, there's uh, more information from the breeding bird survey that gives you an idea of where they actually are breeding and why it's important to focus on those counties specifically. Um, so it's just a, another snapshot of within the state, um, some of the accomplishments so far. And these numbers have uh, gone up since as well. Um, so just give you an idea of how much we're doing within West Virginia. And it is to give you an idea of some of the areas where we're giving out some of these contracts. Um, we have enrolled a few more counties since this image was made, such as in Nicholas County and Wayne County, Mason County, et cetera. Now I'm gonna go over the golden wing warbler a little bit, um, give you some background on their life history and habitat requirements. <clears throat> So they're kind of the opposite of the cerulean warbler, where the cerulean warbler needs mature forest. The golden wing warbler thrives in early successional habitat where it's patchy, herbaceous, you got a lot of shrubs and saplings, and a little bit of scattered canopy trees. So this images on the right really give you a good idea of um, what would be a good ideal golden wing warbler habitat in West Virginia. And a really important factor is that they are typically found above 2,000 feet in elevation. And they require forest edge within about 650 feet from where they're nesting. And in the bottom left there, you can kind of see a little snapshot of their historic breeding range in the gray, kind of showing where they used to be found. Now in the yellow um, is kind of where they're limited to these days. Uh, for their nesting, um, they are a songbird that nests on the ground, uh, which is more common than you might think. Um, <clears throat> they prefer to nest at the base of a blackberry plant or goldenrod. Um, and the most ideal spot for them is less than 120 feet from mature forest. And then a little brief um, snapshot of some of the science behind the management of why it's so important that they actually need mature forest nearby. 
this figure kind of shows you um, over the first 20 days or so of a fledgling golden wing warbler's life, what kind of cover it's using. So you can see in those first five days in that far left bar, they're really just hanging out near the nest in that early successional area. And then as the days go on, they're just gradually shifting more and more over into late successional and uh, different kinds of timber stands away from the um, early successional habitat. So like the cerulean warbler, this research led to the golden wing warbler partnership. So again, the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, um, they have a program called the Working Lands for Wildlife Program. And this applies to um, several species, not just the golden wing warbler, um, but other um, game and non-game species. And again, this is in conjunction with the West Virginia DNR, um, with some help from the DOF, as well as the uh, um, Appalachian Mountain Joint Venture. In, in that image in the bottom left, you can kind of see um, some of the different priority areas around the United States where um, working lands for wildlife does management. Here we have the priority areas for management for the golden wing warbler. Um, you can see, again, it's kind of the inverse of the cerulean warbler, they're kind of more in the eastern part of the state up into the panhandle with a really heavy focus on um, Greenbrier County and Pocahontas County. They really um, like those two counties especially. And again, this is a, not the most up to date, but gives you an idea. Um, since the start of the program in 2012, there's been more than 40 contracts over, probably over 500 acres now. Um, and here's just a snapshot of um, some of the counties where contracts have been given out. Again, the real focus on Pocahontas County there, as you can see. <clears throat> so when we give out a contract, um, here's just an overview of some of the most common practices that we'll suggest and help landowners to implement. Uh, the biggest one, especially for cerulean warblers, is forest stand improvement. So this is where we would go in and help you pick out trees to remove that opens up the canopy um, with a focus on leaving trees that are the most beneficial for cerulean warblers, such as um, white oak and uh, cucumber magnolia, hickory, uh, sugar maple, and removing things like red maple, red oak, um, beech. And um, so you can either do it yourself or work with a professional logger to either do a commercial harvest or just keep the timber for yourself. Um, another thing we commonly do is brush management. So it's controlling for woody invasive plants um, using mechanical or chemical treatments and um, also some mowing. So that's important for the golden wing warbler as well. Um, so some of the things will give you advice for managing would be autumn olive um, and multi-floor rose, Japanese barberry, some of your more common uh, woody invasive plants. And then uh, early successional habitat creation and management. So that includes things like a patch clear cut and making cutback borders. This is really important for the golden wing warbler especially. Um, so it's kind of just helping to create some of that early successional habitat. And in some cases we'll uh, recommend tree and shrub establishment. So um, picking areas where you'll plant specific tree and shrub species that are beneficial for the warblers. Uh, ideal participants for this program are motivated landowners. So if you're participating in this virtual meeting, you're ahead of the game. <laughs> um, yeah, for cerulean warblers, if you have a lot of oak and hickory, uh, sugar maple, yellow poplar, cucumber magnolia, black cherry, those are ideal for the cerulean warbler. If you're within any of those focal areas I showed, if you have more than 10 acres, that's important. Um, if you have less than 10 acres, you could still participate, but we would just give you um, conservation technical assistance. So basically you wouldn't get any cost sharing on anything you do, but we, would, we could still help you develop a plan that would be beneficial. 
if you have a forest stewardship plan that puts you way ahead of the game, that helps us and it helps you and gives you more priority for funding um, when you put your application in. And again, the topography is really important. If you have a lot of ridges and upper slopes, that's ideal for cerulean warbler. And uh, if you're over 2000 feet, that's um, really helpful for golden wing warblers. And then just some incentives to participate. You're creating habitat for these two warblers as well as lots of other game and non-game species. And you really can learn more about your woodlot because um, you're having professional biologists and foresters out there. So you can really learn a lot about your land. Um, and you're just doing active management so it can help you um, develop the timber on your property, um, promote oak regeneration and get some of the, if you have invasive plants on your property, you can help get them under control. So to get involved, um, you're going to want to get in touch with your local NRCS office. Um, you can find that online. Um, so you can't really <laughs> meet in person these days, but you can give a call or send an email and uh, they'll get you started on the right track. And you can turn in an application. After you get an application in, um, myself or someone else will come out and visit your property, get an idea of things and help come up with a conservation plan, which you can see there. That's just kind of a typical image of uh, a map showing like um, different practices you might do in different years. And then you implement the practices. And then after that's done, we'll come and uh, certify that you did the work and get you your reimbursement. And then you end up with wonderful wildlife habitat. So here's just uh, some contact information for the Cerulean Warbler program. Um, if you live kind of more in the northern half of the state, you can get, or the eastern panhandle. You can get in touch with Kyle Aldinger. There's his contact information there. You can call or email him. I cover the southern half of the state. And there's my contact info. And if you're interested in the Golden Wing Warbler program, Tiffany Beachy um, will be the person to contact. She's in uh, Pocahontas County in the Buckeye NRCS office. So you can send her an email or give her a call. And that's all that I have. So thank you. Okay, great. Hey, thanks, Matt. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, there is actually a question that came in. Uh, Glenn's asking uh, if a private landowner signs up for a warbler or other wildlife management plan, does that lead to restrictions for future forest management of their property? Um, that's a good question. Um, basically, you're it would base if there's any restrictions it would apply for the duration of the contract um so that a typical cerulean warbler contract for instance is around five years um so there are some restrictions based on your contract but it, it kind of depends on the site um but uh throughout the planning process um we'll be in contact with you and can discuss anything like that. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, well, uh, no other questions in the chat box right now. Uh, Matt, are you gonna stay on at least till the break? Uh, yeah, I can stick around. Oh, and Tiffany, you just referenced her. She has a little comment there. Uh, each practice has a lifespan, so you would be committing, committed to keeping the land in that condition for that period but you can actually plan for future forest management by doing pre-commercial thinnings, et cetera. So thanks, uh, mm -hmm. Tiffany. Um, okay, so uh, with that, we'll move on to our next speaker here, and uh, that is Chelsea. I think uh, she can unmute her own mic, I think, here. Uh, yep, can you hear me? Okay, great. Yeah, we hear you, Chelsea. And, uh, and just to take off with it. Uh, appreciate you coming. Uh, I saw Chelsea down at the Small Farms Conference this year, 
and uh, she was telling about the National Rabies Program. I, I recall an old colleague of mine, Bill Grafton, once shared this pretty incredible story of a, a standoff with a raccoon. So uh, whenever I think of rabies, I think of raccoons. So uh, Chelsea's agreed to come and kind of tell about this interesting program they've, uh, they've had going on for several, many years, I guess. Chelsea. Okay, well, thank you so much and good morning to everybody um, that is attending today. My name is Chelsea Hartley. I am the rabies technician for West Virginia and I work for the USDA um, Wildlife Services office that's located in Elkins. We are part of the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service and our main mission is to provide federal leadership in managing conflicts um, between humans and wildlife. We do this through a lot of different approaches, through integrated um, approaches, harassment techniques, and, and things like that. So that's all of our contact information. If any of you have questions um, or need to call the office, that is our phone number, which may be important to keep note um, for later on in my talk. So just a little background. Some of you may know who we are and, and what we do, but there's four main components to our agency. The first being protecting people, agriculture, wildlife, followed by a lot of research that's conducted by our research facilities around the country. So the first thing that we do is protect people. We do this through a variety of ways, um, such as in the first picture, a lot of nesting issues with infrastructure, if different species are threatening, maybe power plants, power lines, dams, things that could really harm the human populace. Um, we go in and we work with those species to remove them um, or get them off of that property. We also do some beaver management and things. Um, like in the right picture, you'll see that roadways that are flooded, this is very common in some southern states like North Carolina, Georgia, we'll work with Division of Highways and other cooperative contacts to go in and help um, remove the beavers so that the roadways aren't flooded. We do different waterfowl um, projects where there may be diseases. Um, it, for instance, I've worked with schools where children were getting sick from fecal matter from um, geese and ducks. So we go in and try to get them off of the property and, and do harassment techniques and management as well. Um, one of our biggest programs that we have in the state is our airport hazards management program. So as you can see at the bottom, you know, the really um, famous plane crash on the Hudson, um, that was, you know, due to geese. And so we go on these airports and work with our cooperative partners to try to help with deer strikes, bird strikes, um, things like that. We also really help with protecting agriculture. One of um, our biggest programs in West Virginia as well is the Livestock Protection Program. And some of you may be familiar with this. We work on a lot of farms all over the state where if a farmer's having predation from maybe a fox, a black vulture or cattle, uh, or for their cattle, maybe coyotes, we will go in, we have technicians that are stationed all over the state. They'll go in, they can try to remove that problematic species so that farmers aren't having any more losses for their sheep, goats, and cattle. We also do a lot of disease work when it comes to things like avian influenza, the big outbreak that occurred several years ago. We had several employees go all the way to the Midwest and help with that to control the buildings, sanitize, clean, carcass removal and testing and things like um, of the sort. We have several aquaculture farms all over the country, obviously not in West Virginia, but um, in other states, a lot of the East Coast states, they'll have aquaculture farms that have predation from waterfowl species. So we'll go in and try to get them um, off property and harass so that, that their aquaculture farms do well. And then just out West where there's huge, huge um, plots of growing crops, such as these sunflowers you see or other crop species, when animals such as starlings and crows go in and predate on that, you know, we can go in and work with the landowners as well to help protect their crops. And then finally, the, the big thing is protecting wildlife. We have a feral swine program in West Virginia. That's kind of an invasive species that destroys a lot of habitat, modifies it. It's very hard on the local native populations of animals and species. So we go down and kind of survey for these feral swine to keep them out of the area. So they're not harming our wildlife. That's actually a really big program down in the southern states, um, multi, multi-million dollar programs where they have hundreds of thousands of feral swine. And luckily West Virginia doesn't have a huge population, so it's not, not as big as other states. We also help with a lot of environmental or, um, you know, 
environmental disasters such as pictured in the middle, you know, there's been oil spills or there are natural disasters of tornadoes, floods and, and such. When those animals need help and assistance, um, we will work with our cooperating agencies and vet services and, and help get those animals to safety um, and proper shelter. We also do, um, it, like I said, invasive species, endangered species work. So as you can see, there's shorebirds, sea turtle nests, things of that such, of the like in the eastern part of the U.S. Again, you know, these are just examples. Obviously, we don't have shorebirds really in West Virginia, but, um, or sea turtles, but where they do have those, we'll go in, we'll try to protect those nests, help those endangered or threatened species from predatory species as well. And so, um, We've also done a lot of work with snakes. If you're familiar with the Guam project where they had the brown tree snakes, we went in, um, tried to eradicate that invasive species that was killing, um, and currently are still working to eradicate that invasive species that's killing a lot of the native um, and local bird populations on that island. We do a lot of work down in the Everglades with the pythons. So that's just some ideas of, of some of the things we do all over the country as a whole. And then finally, research. This is our biggest, um, one of our biggest programs that we have that really helps our agency conduct a lot of different experiments as well as habitat studies, behavioral analysis to kind of help with how we need to do habitat modifications and, you know, certain um, baiting strategies and things and how we need to work with these wildlife populations. Our research center, the main one is stationed out in Fort Collins, Colorado. It's the National Wildlife Research Center, which is one of the largest research, wildlife research centers in the country. And they have a lot of different species and animals out there that they really study, do different um, habitat modifications, like I said, behavioral analysis and things to kind of test and see how they react to um, different um, things that are given to them. We also do a lot of genetic studying, genetic coding, um, brainstem tests, things like that, to see disease studies as well. That's on the left, you'll see that um, that's DRIT that's being conducted. That's one of the main ways that we test brainstems for rabies. So they're a really important component to a lot of the things that we do. So that's a little bit of background of wildlife services, just, just a quick kind of capsule. But we're here to talk about rabies. So a lot of you, I'm sure, have heard about rabies and you're very familiar with it. Um, and so rabies is a virus that affects the central nervous system. A lot of times it's transmitted through saliva or central nervous tissue of an infected animal via a bite or scratch. And what makes rabies such a really bad virus is that it is 100% fatal if post-exposure treatment is not initiated. Every year, the cost of living with rabies is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. It accounts for approximately 60 to 70,000 deaths um, globally, a lot of those being children um, in un poor developed countries. In the United States, we have approximately one to three deaths every year that are related to bat rabies. But a lot of the rabies that we see in West Virginia and in the United States as a whole is in our wildlife population. And so that's where we come in. Um, our common carriers, the biggest culprit, um, of course, raccoons. We do get skunks, some foxes. We haven't had a coyote in a while, um, but those are the big take home animals that we see that turn out positive. We also get it in feral and domestic dogs and cats. And that's really important to note because a lot of people don't associate rabies um, with dogs, especially cats. And in common years, in the last year or two, we have seen a very big increase in the amount of cats that have turned out positive and we've seen a lot of exposures because of that. There's been um, in the news maybe some of you have heard in, in certain counties like Morgan in Montegalia County people have been exposed to these cats they've been scratched they've been bit and they've turned out positive. So you know I stress everyone to use a lot of caution you know when they are out if you see a feral cat um, a feral dog anything just be careful because they do carry rabies and we do see a lot of exposures through through cats especially. Um, and then also another important note is any mammal can have rabies. A lot of people think, well, that animal's acting sick, but it's a groundhog, it's a beaver, there's no way it could have rabies. Well, we have seen those um, turn up positive in several states. I know in West Virginia, we've had horses, cattle, sheep, um, deer, we had a deer last year, turn, the DNR had a deer turn up positive last year. 
Um, so, you know, any mammal can carry rabies. So just take note of that when you do see a, a sick animal. As far as human and pet exposures go, our agency really hinges on more of the wildlife non-exposure surveillance standpoint. So when we talk about human and pet exposures, this is something that correlates more with our local health departments and the things that they handle. But the best way to protect yourself from rabies is first, just avoid handling wildlife if at all possible. Um, if you do have to handle wildlife, maybe a carcass or something, use rubber gloves, something that they can't puncture through. Um, just use your PPE accordingly. Vaccinate your pets. That's really actually one of the best ways to combat rabies, especially like I said, in, in cats and feral dogs. Report any suspicious wildlife. This is a really, really important thing that I want to let everybody know. Our agency, we all have our pre-exposure rabies shots. We also have all of the equipment necessary to handle any sick actings that we get. It's one of the biggest components of how we get our brainstem samples um, and our surveillance samples for the state of West Virginia. And so I really, really encourage any of you that if you see any suspicious or sick acting wildlife, please call our state office. Um, we will send a technician out right away. We'll get the animal, have it tested, and we can let you know the results, usually within about a week. Um, I conduct the testing as well as the rabies biologist, so we try to test on a weekly basis. So, you know, again, please, if you see anything suspicious, call us, we can come out and we can take care of that for you. Um, and then finally, do not transport wildlife. Um, this, easier said than done, um, rabies was originally introduced because of translocation of wildlife. And so we really try to discourage that because if you take a very, very healthy animal, um, or a very sick animal, sorry, and you put it into a healthy population or a healthy environment, you are potentially going to spread that disease to that healthy population. And when we see those translocation events, oftentimes that's exactly what's happened. Um, animals have been moved or they have moved themselves. For instance, we have seen translocation events happen um, across country lines even and state lines where they'll get in tractor trailers on trains and things like that. So we really discourage moving sick animals. And then what to do if an exposure occurs. So again, if you see a sick animal and it's not an exposure, you can call us, we'll come, we'll get the animal, have it tested. But if there is an exposure, if you or your pet have been scratched or bit by maybe potentially a you know, rabid animal, first just wash the wound immediately with soap and water, you know, clean it as best as possible. If you can detain the animal, um, you know, in a safe manner, go ahead and do that. It makes it easier for testing. If they can test it, then you kind of know where you are, whether it was positive or not. But if not, um, don't worry about it. It's not worth getting further exposed to this. And then contact your health department immediately it, to have the animal tested. They have a really quick turnaround time, usually in a day or two, and they are the regulatory agency on what to do if an exposure occurs. When you call the health departments, if they need the carcass, we can also work with that, you guys as well. We've done that where we'll come to a residence and get the animal, take it to the health department and they'll ship it out. So, you know, we can definitely work with landowners or anybody that has any issues with the exposures or, or sick animals. So the thing that I really wanna to talk today about is um, our national rabies management program. And this is primarily what I work with being the rabies technician. It's a really, really huge um, multi, multi-million dollar program in the United States, mostly incorporating the Eastern states. Um, as of right now, there's, I think, roughly 18, maybe 17, 18 states that are involved with this program. And there's, a, there's really big goals of this program. It is to stop the spread of raccoon variant rabies in West Virginia, and to just eventually eliminate terrestrial rabies in West Virginia. So, um, we do this through a variety of different ways. This program has been going on now for approximately um, just a little over, I think, 20 years. And the big, big takeaway message from our program is we want to eliminate terrestrial rabies in the U.S. by pushing it off of the East Coast. So you know, that, that's really big goals, really big aspirations. But there's a lot that goes into this program. And so the Four main components are population monitoring, bait distribution, host bait monitoring, and surveillance. Um, if we're gonna get rid of this disease, we have to look at a lot of different components and things of how we're going to do that. 
And so this map kind of gives you a good idea of what we're working with. It's an older map, but it still stands true today. Rabies, raccoon variant rabies, I say. And, and when we're talking about rabies, and when I'm talking about it, I do mean raccoon variant rabies, not bat strain. Um, so a lot of people don't realize that rabies is primarily on the East Coast. You know, we're so used to it in our everyday lives. We hear about it. But when you look at this map, there is nothing West. It is all East. And so there's a few, there are a few cases down in Texas and Arizona where we see some crossover into some fox, um, fox that are getting rabies. But primarily we're worrying about the East Coast when we talk about this program. And these are all the states that are involved in this. And so the idea is to essentially push this virus off of the East Coast um, and doing a lot of different oral rabies vaccinations and things that I'll go into um, later. The only other work that we do outside of the primary US um, is one of our territories in Guam. We do a little bit of work there. Um, and then some of the islands where mongoose reside, we're trying to get rid of um, rabies in mongoose. And they've been working on that for the past several years as well. So the first thing we have to think about is, okay, well, we wanna get rid of this disease and we wanna get rid of this virus. So how do we do that? Well, we have to start with our population estimates. We need to know where the raccoons are, how many, so we can accommodate our baiting strategies for that. And so these density studies have been conducted over the past 20 years, all over the state. Every year we switch it, you know, in different um, counties. And what we do is we have several technicians go out, put out 50 traps, over 10 trap nights, or 50 traps over 10 trap nights. And so we record every raccoon, every skunk, every rabies vector species that we get. And then we record that. And kind of what we see after doing this for many, many years is this map's from 2010, but the results have still been the same. We're still getting the same numbers even now, is that the more Northern you are, that's where you have your greatest densities of raccoons. You're looking at about three times more raccoons in the northern panhandle than down south in your Greenbrier um, areas and in the southern areas of the state. And so that tells us something that if our raccoons are primarily in the northern areas, we need to focus a lot of baiting strategies, a lot of our um, ORV operations in those areas because those are our problem areas. And so like I said, the Northern Panhandle in Morgantown is where we see that, and it accommodates for everything that we do. So it gives us a good baseline of where are our raccoon populations, which then correlates with our ORV base. And this is kind of our bread and butter of the whole program. It's what keeps the program running. It's the main component, which is our oral rabies vaccination. And as I was saying, you can see that with raccoon variant rabies being east, the idea is to push this. So this blue indicates our ORV bait zone. It's where we drop oral rabies vaccines every year in the state of West Virginia. Um, it does move back 20 years ago. It was all the way west over in Wayne and Huntington counties and things. And then we gradually move it. After so many years of no rabies positives, if we have no rabies positives, it's okay to move it several miles there is a formula that the national program uses to kind of see how far they wanna move the zone. But the idea is to just keep moving this zone east and push rabies further and further down the line. And last I spoke with the national program, they had an idea of maybe in the next 10 to 15 years to have West Virginia free and clear of um, terrestrial rabies with an overall program goal of by 20, like 2050, 2050, I think, to have raccoon variant rabies completely eradicated from the U.S. So this program is going to take many, many years and a lot of work, but it is working. We are seeing. So if you're located in any of those counties, you know, in August, about the third and fourth week, we do our oral rabies vaccination. So we'll drop the baits from the sky via helicopter and airplane. We also do some hand baiting in different cities. Um, and this, this was in 2018. The zones actually changed. Um, last year, it incorporated Mon County and the city of Morgantown because we were getting so many positives that we decided to incorporate that area as well in the zone. So, like I said, if you're in any of those counties, you know, about second and third or third or fourth week of August, just keep a lookout. You may see um, some of our baits that we have dropped or you may see us flying. 
And this is the ORV zone overall. So it gives you the big picture of what I was saying about rabies being on the east. We're trying to maintain this zone. That's where the dark blue is. That was in fiscal year 2018. But you can see where we're trying to maintain the zone where we drop all of our oral rabies vaccine to kind of that virus away so that it doesn't spread west anymore. Because if it spreads west, you know, that's really bad news for us. And we don't want to go back. We don't, we don't want to go back. So we do most of our baiting on the east. Like I said, there are some um, fox variant rabies down in Texas, and we try to maintain that line as well so that we don't get crossover from um, Mexico or anything like that. We're trying to keep that barrier. They do fly that every year. But as you can see from the map as well, West Virginia is actually um, one of the biggest states where we fly the most and we do some of the most rabies work. So West Virginia as a whole is very important in this oral rabies vaccine program right now. So just to give you an idea of kind of what we fly out of, what we use, um, in the top right corner, those are our helicopters. We have two. We fly out of Wheeling, um, Ohio Airport every year about first or second week of August. So we fly mostly just along the Ohio River. This is a newer program we started doing because of all the little islands and things that are in the river. Um, we wanted to hit those. You can't do that really with the fixed wing or hand baiting. So that way we could get up close and personal with the little islands and the riverbank. So we fly out of those for about three or four days, hit the entire Ohio River, and then we moved on to our fixed wing, which is the plane on the bottom, right? Those fly at very, very low levels, and we just drop the majority of our baits from those as well, and we are located in Buchanan. Um, so right now we're flying out of the Upter Regional Airport. We used to fly out of um, Clarksburg, but that has changed in recent years. So if you see those aircraft in August, that's us um, dropping the baits. And the baits to the left, they kind of give you a good idea of, of what they look like. So at the top left corner, that's our coated sachet. Those are the primary baits that we distribute in West Virginia. They kind of look like a ketchup packet um, coated in fish meal. And the vaccine is inside, it's like a pink liquid. And then to the right, the block looking baits are our fish meal polymer blocks. And those are dropped, or those are um, distributed via in our cities when we do our hand baiting. And so you only see those in the city areas, not in the wooded areas. Um, they're not distributed out of planes because they are heavy. <laughs> and uh, we've dropped them out of planes in the past and it was not a good idea. So <laughs> we don't drop those anymore out of planes. And then the bottom bait is a newer um, experimental bait called OnRab that we've just started using in recent years. It's kind of got a caramel coating, waxy coating on it. Um, and it actually smells pretty good. So those are the three different bait types that you'll find in West Virginia. So if you see any of those, that's what they are. And they do have phone numbers on them. So if you were to call, it should uh, take you to somebody from Mariel, which is a manufacturer. They can answer any questions that you have. And then the approximate baits that we do every year is different based on our zone, but anywhere from 1.5 to 1.7 million baits are distributed in West Virginia. So we are putting out a lot of baits on the ground really trying to cover the large vast area that we have. And so this was our fiscal year 2018 grid that we have. You can see earlier I was talking about the densities of raccoons. So this is where it comes into play when we start to bait because in the Northern Panhandle where we have our biggest densities um, of raccoons, we drop more of the VRG um, which are the little we did vrg one year and then this last year we just did on rab which are the little caramel um, looking baits that i just showed you but as you can see it's a darker blue which lets you know that we're dropping at a higher density of 300 baits per square kilometer versus down south where we have lower densities of raccoons and we're dropping only 75 baits per square kilometer so the densities really play in how many baits that we're going to drop in certain locations and so the um, eastern part of the zone is all VRG, which is the little ketchup packet looking white baits that you saw. And then everything in gold is the onrab, which is that experimental um, bait that looks like the little caramel raviolis. So depending on where you are in the state, you may see different bait types, but that's our overall zone of what we fly every year in West so in case any of you find these baits and, you know, obviously we try to drop them primarily in wooded areas, but every year people do find them. 
And when they do, these are some of the common questions that we get. And so if you guys find one or somebody else that you know finds a bait, here's some, you know, kind of simple answers to the questions they may have, which is, you know, a lot of people ask, well, will this hurt my cat? Will this hurt my dog? They ate it. No, they'll be fine. This bait has been tested in over 60 species of animals, including cats and dogs. Um, we've done many field trials at our research center and it is perfectly fine for um, different animals to ingest. It does not harm them, but it does not constitute for your rabies vaccination. So a lot of people will think, well, my dog ate a bait, it's vaccinated, right? No, we're not a veterinary clinic. Um, that's not what this is for. It's strictly for wildlife use. So, you know, you still need to go get your animals vaccinated, even if they eat a bait. And um, the big one is it does not cause rabies. So some people will say, well, you're dropping rabies out of the sky and you know, you're, you're putting it everywhere. No, these vaccines only contain a single gene from the outer coating of the vaccine, not the whole virus itself. And so it, it does not cause rabies. Um, again, we've done lots of field trials with this bait before we ever started dropping them out of planes. And so they are, they are safe. And so if you find a bait, what do you do? Well, we ask that if it's in a suitable habitat where a raccoon or a skunk or something may find it, leave it alone if possible. But if it's maybe in your driveway or somewhere that's not suitable habitat, as long as you're wearing gloves, um, you know, you can move the bait, just maybe toss it in the woods or something. Um, if you are immunocompromised or pregnant, you know, we recommend not, don't mess with it, let somebody else do it. But um, you can wear gloves, throw it in the habitat, or you can also put it in a, a plastic bag and throw it away if you really wish. We get people that call every year on what to do. They, they happen to find one maybe floating in a pool or something. <laughs> um, and then wash your hands thoroughly. And that's, that's it. Um, and if you do have any questions, you can call our state office. You can call your local health department. They handle the majority of the questions regarding these baits. So you can call them, call us. We'll answer any questions that you do have. And so when it comes to post-bait monitoring enhanced surveillance, the next thing we do is we have to determine the efficacy of our baits. So are the baits working? What are their titer levels? So as you can see, we do what's called post-bait trapping every year. We'll go in certain areas where we drop the baits We'll take titer levels, we'll sedate the raccoons, take their titer levels some genetics and things, and then run that to see are the baits working. And then we'll also do our hand surveillance, which is a lot of what I handle in the state, where we'll take those sick or strange acting calls. I do pick up, we all pick up a lot of roadkill, any hunters, trapper takes, nuco samples, any samples that we can get in any way, we will take um, so that we can test it and just make sure that we don't get any positives. We wanna keep monitoring because we have this high priority ERS area where we wanna make sure that rabies is not west of our zone. So all those counties, it's very pertinent that we get as many samples as possible so that we know, is there rabies out there? Um, and do they have good titer levels? And is what we're doing really working? And so this map shows you that, yes, it is. Um, everything east, you can see all of the rabies positives from all the samples that have been collected. And so, but you're not seeing anything west. So this program does really work in that it keeps most of our rabies east of the state. Um, we do get some bat variants west, but again, we're only talking about raccoon variant rabies. Um, and the areas where the density is highest, as you can see in the Northern Panhandle, Mon County, Preston, we get a lot of positives in those areas as well. So overall, you know, through our surveillance, through our RV bait drop, you know, we can see that it is working. And then I think I'm about out on time, but um, a couple quick things. We do a lot of research. Um, the first being with ONRAB, like I said, it's an experimental bait. West Virginia was the first state in the country to um, try this bait out. And we did a lot of field trials with it down in Greenbrier County for six years where we dropped the bait, we would test raccoons, and then we would see if they were, um, they had rabies titers. And what we found for the, based on our field trials is Yes, they actually had really good titer levels. A lot of the species that we saw did have their titer levels. They did have on wrap. So it really works and it works, works well. And so now that bait is being used in many states. Um, it's still not licensed in the US. It's still under an experimental license, but we're hoping to get it licensed very soon. But West Virginia was kind of the foothold of where on wrap started. And then we did a skunk telemetry study um, as well with this. 
to just check and see how do these animals move because we found they weren't eating as many baits as raccoons so we thought do they just not move do they not have a big home range and so what we found was they actually did have a huge home range we had one skunk move five miles in a matter of just a couple days so we thought well it's not that it's not the baiting issue because we drop baits every um few miles in between when we do our grids but maybe it's a bait texture issue or the lure that's used. So now the NWRC is trying new bait types and new lure types and they're testing to see what skunks like. Maybe there's something else that attracts them a little bit better. And so that gives you an idea of just some of the, um, you know, research that we're doing and everything that kind of goes into our oral rabies vaccination and our national rabies management program in West Virginia. Um, and so I'll leave for questions. <laughs> Great, uh, great, Chelsea. Very interesting. Uh, cute picture there at the end. Uh, Roger Osborne is asking a question. He says, has Wildlife Services ever considered the use of drones to drop baits in more sensitive areas where manned aircraft might not be the best option? So that's actually a really good question. And yes, we have. Um, the only thing about drones is they are very regulated. And we have to be very careful where we use them because there's a privacy issue there because if we're flying over people's private lands, we have to get permission, we have to get different documents signed. Um, there's a lot that goes into it with our drones. We have several technicians that actually have their license and they do use drones for different applications, especially um, to do surveys and things. But that's something we haven't quite reached yet um, just because of all the kind of paperwork and legalities that go into it. So maybe one day, I know that they have worked on different drone um, issues and things. So that is a really good question. Interesting. Okay, well, great, Chelsea, thank you very much. Are you gonna be staying on for a while or you gotta jump off here? Um, I actually have to jump off because I have a conference call after this, so. Well, we have your contact information. So uh, we appreciate you coming in and sharing that a very cool program that you're involved in and uh, good luck with getting off the East Coast. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so, uh, so our next speaker is a colleague of mine at, in the West Virginia University Extension Service, uh, Dr. Mahfouz Rahman. And uh, Mahfouz is our plant pathologist and he is the one that anytime I get uh, a, a, a photograph of a tree with uh, something I don't recognize, I, uh, I shoot him an email. So I think the last one was a uh, bacterial uh, slime slime flux or something like that so uh, on a sugar maple i think that was just a couple of days ago so so uh, mafuz do you have control of your uh, uh camera there okay now oops sorry about that so now you should have control of it all right i unmuted myself i hope you can hear me we can hear you yes and now I have to share my screen. Great, and, and we've asked uh, Mahfouz, uh, he's a, he has broad experience on lots of different things we, we call on him for, but uh, today he's gonna tell, you, tell us a little bit about uh, spruce and pine uh, diseases, some of the things that have been uh, hitting that. Mahfouz? Okay. So I hope you can uh, see my screen, right? Yes, we can see it very well. Thanks. And Thank you. Very well too. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's uh, really my pleasure to be part of this program. Uh, as uh, Dave mentioned, I am a plant pathologist. I run the diagnostic clinic. I'm not a forest pathologist, but um, you know, in the diagnostic clinic, I have to take care of all the commodities, all the plant problems coming. So. I have to have some idea or at least some diagnostic capacity to diagnose all these commodities. Um, in my last nine years at uh, WVU, what I have seen problem-wise or plant problem-wise uh, is a landscape tree, which is a uh, Colorado blue spruce has been the single most frequent sample I have been receiving. So based on the, my recommend, um, on my diagnostics, I did the recommendation, but really I was not sure that, that 
recommendation has been working very well. So I did some research on that. Uh, Dave was part of it. And uh, I will like to share some of the research results with you. There are two major uh, needle cast uh, with uh, very similar symptom, but two different fungal pathogens are involved. Rhizospherical coffee and stigma, stigmina larvae. Colorado blue spruce is undoubtedly the most affected species with other species like Engelmann spruce. White and Norway spruce are relatively resistant, but stressed ones can be affected. So although other states are seeing more of the stigmina problem, but I have not seen stigmina as a major problem in West Virginia. So still our major problem is rhizosphere and needle cast. In both rhizosphere and stigmina, symptoms are very, very similar. Uh, second year needles, you will see the uh, needle drop and the symptoms on the second year needles. It always starts from the lower limbs. As all fungal infections need high humidity, you might have some idea what, what, what are the factors uh, affecting the fungal growth and infection of plants. Lower branches near the ground obviously are exposed to high humidity from moist ground after rain. So infection starts on new growth in the late spring, but symptom is not visible until the next fall or until the next year. After the infection in the presence of moisture, a sexual fruiting body called pycnidia. So these are some technical jargons I need to use. You, some of you may be familiar with those. Uh, so pycnidia is the asexual fruiting body, as you know, uh, fungus can uh, actually reproduce both sexually and asexually. As you know, conifer have rows of white stomates on needles. Infected needles grow those pycnidia through the stomates. You will see it in the next slide. So here at the left-hand side, what you are seeing, actually an infected Colorado blue spruce. So I have been following this tree and unfortunately I have to say this tree is now gone, it is dead after a few years because disease has gone up all the way and eventually that tree has been taken out. As you can see here from the lower limbs, you know, most of the needles are actually dropped. So at the, at the time I took the, took the photo. So, but at the right hand side and the top right, what you are seeing two Colorado blue spruce needles infected. Obviously one of them is dead at the right hand side and the left hand side one was not completely dead. It had green color, but you can see those fin head kind of, of structures, those pycnidias coming through the um, uh, stomachs. So those are the kind of telltale, you know, like symptom of rhizosphere and needle cast. So what I can do if I take only one pycnidium from that and then smash it under the microscope and then look at it, I can see thousands and thousands of those spores, what you can see at the right hand side, lower part with that. So for the management of this disease, what I have been seeing for the last many years, homeowners or in, in case of uh, lawn care companies, you know, they are coming and then taking the lower limbs out. But I don't think that's a, that's a solution for uh, this disease because infection keeps moving upward and at some point that whole disease is being killed by the disease. So how the disease, so that's why I really asked the question, why, what is the best option for us to control the disease? And uh, how the disease spread from one tree to another. That's why we took a project to investigate whether a community-based approach, you know, like 
taking care of the, all the infected or slightly infected plants at the early stage of the disease, how that can change the disease dynamics. So from that project, what I realized we really need to take a holistic approach based on community because one, if you are having one infected tree and then you are taking care of it, but your neighbor is not taking care of the, of the infected tree he has. So eventually those infected needles will drop off and then it will come to your way and then reinfect your tree. So what we did, we did actually, we did use some fungicides in that trial. I understand that fungicides used in tree, especially is are not always feasible because some of the trees are too large. Some of the trees may be too close to the home, home site. And especially in the, in the landscape, they are there in the home site. So, and in some cases, disease has gone too far. So in those situations, you may not be use, able to use uh, fungicides, but in our, in our trial, what we did, we used two different fungicides, chlorothalonil, which is, uh, the trade name is Bravo, Daconil, and there are many other trade names for that fungicide. And another one is thiophenate methyl, the trade name is Topsin M. So these two fungicides, the reason I use these two fungicides because if you go online and then find recommendations for digosphere and needle cast, you will find these two names. So uh, in, in the next few slides, you, you'll see some of the results we got from this, from this uh, trial. But once again, I kept asking why the infection is, why the infection is coming from, why the infection starts at the bottom. Uh, taking the lower limbs probably be helpful, but we need other uh, combination uh, of treatments with that. So here you can see, these are the Colorado blue spruce trees, highly infected lower branches or lower limbs. So we took highly infected ones because, you know, if you apply fungicides, fungicides are not curative they can provide prevention of new infections. So we took the highly infected needles, sorry, leaves from the, uh, from the lower areas and then applied uh, Topsin M and Daconil. So what we found the next season, those trees definitely looked much better than uh, when at the time we, we did applied uh, those fungicides. So, but, the question is, uh, I was not quite happy with the result that I got with these two products. So I kept asking whether these recommendations are the best or we can look for some more highly effective, more effective fungicides. So I isolated the fungus from the uh, disease tissue, diseased needles, and then grew, grew them inside the lab, in the, in the lab and then you can see I tested five different fungicides. Uh, those are Cabrio, Daconil, Fontelis, Effluvia Top, and Topsin M. So you can see Daconil and Topsin M, those are the two products I kept common that I used in my, in my, in my trial. But in this result, what you are seeing in the horizontal axis, fungicide concentration. We, I used different fungicide concentration from 0.001 ppm to 100 ppm. And in the vertical axis, what you are seeing, the colony growth, fungal growth of that compared to the control where we did not put any fungicide. So in the, you are definitely seeing the blue line, uh, sorry, the yellow line here had the lowest growth in different concentrations of the fungicide. That means that has been the highest effective, that could be the highest, most effective fungicide for controlling this rhizosphere calcopy, that's the causal agent. So Effluvia top, as you can see, these products have 
multiple or at least two active ingredients there. Uh, for Aprobia top, there's two active ingredients. Pontelis has one active ingredient. Cabrio has one. Toxin M has one, and Daconil has one. So definitely, we did see some difference in the results. So we wanted to do some more work on that. And from Syngenta, I got four different fungicides that uh, that are ornamentally used for us. That providing those to us. Mural, Palladium, Postiva, Concert, and I am including Toxin M. So you can see those four different products, all, each of them has multiple or at least two active ingredients. So we'll be working again with those active ingredients and with those products in vitro and in vivo. That means we'll be doing the first trial in the, in the lab and then the most effective ones will be taking to the field again. And then hopefully I will be able to share these results with you at some point later. So stigmina, what you are seeing here, stigmina is showing very similar symptom. The needles, affected needles are kind of brownish and then those second year needles normally drop off. So by looking at the symptom, rhizospira needle cast and stigmina needle cast are very, very similar. But for my diagnostic purpose, what I do, as you can see at the left-hand side, those are again the fruiting body, but these are called sporodokia. Once again, you know, some technical term here, but um, these growth are very different. Yeah, with the hair-like projections in the, in the, around it, but if you have looked uh, on the other slide when I showed you the pycnidia from rhizospira, those are like mustard seeds. And also you can see at the right hand side, the spores are very, very different. So let's now think about this, what we are doing for both rhizospira needle cast and stigmina needle cast. So very similar uh, recommendations, but for stigmina, we have few more products like chlorothalonyl copper, mencozeb, azoxystrobin, and phytoclostrobin, and thiophenate methyl for, the, for treating stigmina needle cast. So as I mentioned, you know, like uh, these uh, Colorado blue spruce is the most susceptible to both of these diseases, rhizospira needle cast and stigmina needle cast, but Nora spruce, oriental spruce, and Serbian spruce can also be infected, but the infection severity remains very low on these. Another disease is Cytospora canker on conifers, especially on spruce. Uh, you will see more or less similar symptom lower branches will drop the needles. But in addition, what you are seeing here at the right hand side, in case of Cytospora canker, obviously there will be canker on the stem or on the trunk. And due to that canker, due to that infection, uh, the host, the tree will lose some resin because they will try to resist the infection there. So you'll see that resin coming out Unfortunately for this disease, there is no fungicide effective against this disease. This is called a stress-related disease. Many trees, as you know, many trees are growing not exactly in the proper side. They are, they are growing in size that are not optimum. So they get stressed. So proper site selection, fertilization, and irrigation as needed. Those are stress alleviating factors, and those are the basically the treatments we can do, but there is no fungicidal option for cytospora canker. So let's now talk about a few diseases on fines. Uh, here you can see fine tree, the brown needles, and then those needles obviously will drop off what we call again uh, needle cast, but in this case, the disease is called needle blight because at the later stage, all the needles are getting blighted. 
So once again, uh, two different uh, microspherula species, microspherula pinae and then microspherula dearnesi. These are the two species involved. And then the first disease is called Dothystroma needle blight. And the second one is called brown spot needle blight. So here you can see uh, in that Dothystroma needle blight, some kind of bands at the early stage of the infection on the needles. And then eventually those needles will be highly infected and then those needles will get all brown and then drop off. Austrian, Fonderosa, and Mugo finds are highly, highly susceptible to this disease. Scots and red finds are, have some resistance against it. So the fungicides effective against it, copper and mencozeb, recommended to apply 14 days interval, three to four different times during the early spring. And another disease, what I said is microspherula dearnesi causing it, and then only difference is you will see kind of spores instead of the bands on the needles. But this disease is more prevalent on long leaf finds. And you can see the spores are also kind of different compared to the microspherula finae. So the next disease is very, very prevalent, especially on Austrian fine. It is called Diplodia T blight. It used to be called Sphaeropsis blight. Some of you may be familiar with this disease. Austrian fine, as I said, the most susceptible host for this disease. And Scots fine, red, red, red fine, mugo fine, and ponderosa fine are also susceptible. Once again, like many fungal diseases, you know, stressed plants or stressed trees are getting infected fast. So this is also a disease on stressed plants, especially on Austrian fines. The disease in, in this case, the infection takes place in the needles at the tip of the branches. So it is kind of different like other diseases I have been talking about. And also here you can see on the cones, we can see lots of fruiting bodies on the cones at uh, the later stage of the disease. Uh, many people tried fungicides to control these diseases, but really it has not been effective. So our recommendation do not plant Austrian fine. The last disease I'll be talking about, especially this one is, can infect all conifers, pine, spruce, especially for tree fern. This is really, really a very, very important disease. It's called Phytophthora root rot. And what you are seeing here, the symptom is basically all those dead plants here. Although at the later stage, those plants will die, but you will not be able to identify the disease by looking at this because there are many overlapping symptoms like suppressed growth, poor vigor, yellowing, undersized needles. Those are the early stage of the symptom. And eventually those plants will wilt and die. Here you are seeing some yellowing of the, of the plants at the early stage and bunks, uh, brands die back at the later stage. And all of this phytophthora actually is called water mold because water takes them, water actually provides their optimum growth. That's why you will see more plants will be affected at the low lying areas. Uh, once again, for identification or for diagnostic purpose, you know, it will not be easy just to look at the above ground for symptoms, but what you will have to do, you will have to pull out those suspected plants and then look at the root system. Here you will see the root areas or crown areas are kind of brownish. And these trees will lose most of these root hairs. And here you can see these two saplings actually are not showing any root hairs. So 
due to phytophthora infection, these they lost all those root hairs. They are discolored. And but the most important diagnostic character is if you take those, take a, a pocket knife and then scrape off the bark of those infected trees or suspected trees, what you will see kind of reddish brown discoloration of the cambium. So the cambium, as you know, is just uh, underneath the bark. So once the cambium, the, the fungal infection kills the cambium, basically even the, this tree is, is being killed by, that, by the fungal infections. And this uh, slide basically showing you once again the connection of water with the, with the disease. Here you can see that disease probably initiated uh, at the upper side of this tree farm and then that Phytophthora infection, those Phytophthora fungal spores came with the water downstream and then on its way, it infected most of the plants and then you can see many of those plants are actually dead. So what are the management options for Phytophthora root rot? As I mentioned, water management is the major, can play the major, major role in Phytophthora management, but there are really very good fungicide, uh, fungicides available for controlling Phytophthora root rot. Some of those products are here, you can see, Elliot, Subdue Max, Elliot, Megaline, Phosphite, or Agrifos. Those are the products really, really very effective against Phytophthora root rot. And these products are called MP Mobile. That means these products can move both upward and downward, wherever you apply. If you apply them, on the foliage, on the branches or on the needles, eventually they will move downward and then end up going to the root system. That the same thing will happen if you dr apply drench and then eventually it will be uptaken by the root system and then will go upward. So they provide very good protection against Phytophthora root rot. Uh, but just keep in mind that only fungicide applications will not take good care of this disease. You will have to be very, very careful about drainage and water management on those trees if you really want to effectively control Phytophthora root rot. So I think that's all uh, I had. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, Dave, I, can, I may have one or two minutes to answer those, right? Yes, great. Thanks, Bafuz. Uh, none have come in the group chat, but uh, I have a couple. Um, you know, all these different diseases is is the is is the main um, uh, problem when these fungi grow. They plug up the, the the stomates or something in the leaves, or or what's the actual kind of cause of death of these leaves? So it, it depends, you know, like those uh, needle cast disease I talked about, uh, those are basically, you know, they are, they are infecting the needles and then eventually they plague the stomates because their fruiting bodies are coming through the stomates. So obviously, you know, like at that point, they are not uh, photosynthesizing and they're not producing any carbohydrates and also uh, eventually those needles are being killed and those needles are dropped off or casted. You know, that's why the name of the disease is needle cast. But in other diseases, it's kind of different like Phytophthora root or obviously it's a soil borne disease. Uh, there's Phytophthora, different species. Phytophthora cinnamomy is the major species infecting uh, tree, you know, like tree saplings, or even many trees, uh, either in the in the landscape or in the forest setting. So it goes through the root system. It infects through the root system, and it plugs the vascular bundles in many cases. And in this case, it kills the cambium. So eventually, the growth stops, and then 
the whole tree is killed. So, you know, it depends on what kind of fungal pathogen is infecting that tree and then uh, that the eventual result, unfortunately, many of these trees die. Uh, but if we can intervene, you know, early enough, we can do the diagnosis early enough and then we can do some kind of treatment. Uh, not all of the diseases, but some of the diseases are preventable. And that's why the recommendations and the research results are really useful. Well, that, that was fascinating. Uh, I had the feeling when you showed that picture of those little pycnidiospores, uh, yeah. uh, just uh, kind of like, you know, the current state, we're in these virus kind of thing where, you know, you get some of these like fungi popping these things out. It's just everywhere. So it's almost like once you get into the tree, it just seems so hard to, uh, to, to solve the problem. Yeah, and, and for our county agents, when I do the diagnostic training, I really, you know, like, put some of those infected needles inside the plastic bag with a moist paper towel and then I give them like 20x uh, magnifying lens and then they can see those pycnidia actually the rows of uh, pycnidia coming through the uh, stomachs. That's kind of fascinating to look at uh, and very uh, diagnostic too. Yeah, so, so uh, one of the things, I don't know if you mentioned, but uh, that you uh, run the plant diagnostics lab? Yes. Plant disease diagnostics lab. And so if anyone has uh, problems, they, is, are you the one they send them to? Uh, that's right. That's right. But, you know, like, uh, I encourage uh, clientele to actually come to our counties. Uh, they should contact the county agents and uh, for a professional development, you know, we, uh, the RIPM team train our county agents. So they, uh, they are the first one to look at the problems. And in some cases they can identify it, uh, but uh, they can contact with us for recommendations. Okay, but so uh, eventually those samples, you know, they, they are not able to identify the problem they eventually send it to the diagnostic clinic. So start with the county agent and I'll work your way up uh, to you uh, here in Morgantown if, uh, if need be. <laughs> yes, um, I, I want to keep our county agents in the loop, you know, like because they're the first one in the county. The problem comes, uh, clientele probably communicate with them first and then eventually we, we if they're not able to solve the problem, uh, I, I always help in the, doing the diagnosis and then providing the best recommendation to them. Great, well, thanks Mafuz uh, for coming on this morning and, uh, and we're, we're actually uh, scheduled to take a break here, but uh, I know that Matt is still on, Matt Eberly from uh, when he was telling us about the Warbler project. So um, maybe the best way to do this is if anyone has any uh, questions for Matt still or for Mafuz uh, to uh, shoot them and they, they don't want to uh, shoot it to everyone you can uh, you can text them privately this is that's one way you can you know, communicate with one another and uh, appreciate that uh, the questions that have come in to everyone so we've had, a, had some good ones so uh, uh, after the break we're gonna you know this first time we've done this so I don't know if a 30 minute break's good or just to, you should have less but we are going to stick with our uh, agenda and uh, and then when we come back John Cobb who's on uh, he's going to tell us about some pretty interesting things that he, he's been doing on his properties our 2019 tree farmer of the year and then Dr. Ben Spong who is also here uh, is going to tell you about uh, he's our forest operations specialist he's going to tell you about uh, some BMP so um, best best management practices for uh, for uh, our forestry activities so uh, with that I'm going to take a break and we'll be We'll reconvene at uh, 11 o'clock, uh, probably be on just a few minutes before that. And in the meantime, you can sit and chat with each other uh, using the, the, the chat box. And uh, we'll see you in a little bit. Hey, Dave. Hey. Do I, do I need to unshare or something? Yeah, there's a uh, couple questions here. Oh, OK. I don't know if you saw Robin's, uh, but uh, she asks, uh, I have several blue spruce with needle cast. Some are clearly beyond help, but I am understanding that if I, if caught in the first couple of years, they may be treatable. 
Okay, let me have a look on the. Yeah, it's in the chat box. Yeah, I can see it. Okay, great. And then there's then there's another one uh, uh, that uh, Mike Fleming gave or asked. Uh, the first question from Robin. Yeah, she, exactly. She is on, and I, you know, uh, if it goes too far, probably. We, it's not treatable, you know, like, and sometimes trees are too large, uh, it's not feasible to treat them. But uh, smaller trees, and then if you can do the diagnosis for, um, at the early stage, it is treatable. Uh, can the fungicides mentioned in the presentation be purchased and applied by the homeowner or is a license needed? Okay. Uh, those two fungicides, uh, those are generally used fungicides. You do not need a pesticide license for using those. Uh, but again, the caveat here is you have to follow the uh, in a label direction. If it's saying you should not use close to five meters of your house, it's not. I those chlorothaconil and uh, toxin M, those are those can be used. You know there is no there is not much restriction with those as far as I know. But the other ones I am testing now, you know, more effective ones. Um, Syngenta is actually in the process of registering those for ornamental use. So those will also be available, but I have to look at it either when I see good result, either those need um, a pesticide license. But for these two, no. I was muted, sorry. I, you, you just see so much of that blue spruce needle cast all over the place. And some of it looks like it's all, all the, you know, already gotten over halfway. Is there, is, there a, is there a rule of thumb that you use to determine whether or not that can be treated? Uh, it's not <laughs> rule of thumb, but unfortunately, it's very difficult to control, you know, like I did the trees, you know, I treated, uh, it's in Morgantown and then uh, I, it's probably treatable if you can have, if you have a good sprayer to reach on those, you know, upper limbs, you can do that. It's basically, you know, like, the prevention of new growth, the prevention of infection in the new growth. So if you can prevent, if you can save um, the new growth, you know, first year growth, that that should keep the tree go, go, going. So you, if you can treat them, I think, you know, like you can, you can, go ahead and do it. But in many cases, trees are too big. And then, but once again, if like 50% of the limbs are already infected and needles are shredded, shredded already, I would say no, probably it's not what. Eventually that tree will, will die. Not quite sure. Uh offhand how many years uh, blue spruce retains its needles. Do you know that? Five years. Five, is it five? Okay. Five to, five to six years, but um, if they're infected in the second year, needles will all go away. And so, you know, that's, that's basically weaken the tree 
like any other plant, if you do not have photosynthetic apparatus there, they will eventually be weakened and then uh, die eventually. So, but for my recommendation is to take off the lower limbs, those that are touching the soil line. So, because the infection starts from there. So, if you are taking those limbs out, the initial, inf it can prevent the initial infection. And obviously, combination of fungicide application uh, can give you some additive effect. But, you know, I, I will continue that research probably, you know, with the, the new fungicides I received already. So uh, I hopefully at the list, I will uh, send you the results so you can share with the group. That would be great. You know, uh, you mentioned, what is it, uh, microsferella? Microsferella. Microsferella, yeah. In white pine, I think that's the one uh, our for, the former pathologist, uh, Jill Hoff, was telling about, uh, telling us about, they were really monitoring that because they were seeing a lot of our, the old white pine plantations and natural stands of white pine really getting hit hard by something. Are you, are you in that loop? Well, you know, like there are a few other problems, both on spruce and uh, pine. Those we call uh, decline, you know, physiological decline and environmental stress, few other things. So, and we, you know, like get a sample, but we do not, we are not able to isolate any fungal agent from those. Then we look at it uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, one homeowner from uh, Berkeley County, you know, she sent me photos and everything. I gave her some ideas and even she looked at it and then she <laughs> then agreed, okay, it's a, it's a decline physiological and, and you know, site related. So those in those cases, you know, like there are many people, those who are looking at it really know uh, solution for those. But if you see something, some fungal growth in there or the diseases like uh, Microsperla finae and Microsperla dearnessi, those are causing, um, you know, there's two diseases like uh, needle blight, then definitely we can treat those. Once again, it depends how big the tree is. Yeah, Dylan has another kind of a comment about uh, treatment of these uh, spruces and uh, and uh, different conifers. You see that? Yeah, these fungicides can, and I believe should be used as a yearly preventative, even if the tree has not picked up the needle cast as well, I would recommend landowners to do this for any blue spruce they may have, as well as Douglas spot. Dylan, I 100% agree with you. And that's what the preventative measures they should take. And it, it you know, if, if you are doing that in the early spring when the new growth just came out, just two applications, 14 days interval is very good. That's, that's, that's really good um, recommendation to make. But unfortunately, many of the homeowners and um, even lawn care company people, they do not follow that. So they're kind of, rather than being preventative, they are reactive, you know. They try to hunt the, 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 the tree, like they are saying, oh, okay, you know, like lower 50% of the limbs are barren, no, no, no needles there. Then, oh my God, something has happened to this tree. And that's kind of, kind of late. So, you know, at, at, like lower 1%, uh, 2% up to 5%, then I will say, okay, take those highly affected needles out 
and then apply. But what Dylan is saying is, is the best. Let's see here. Well, we're getting close to starting up. Uh, <clears throat> got a couple more minutes and um, Here's uh, uh, here we go. Uh, Lawrence has another comment. I think uh, that last word uh, was weather. Maybe are these going to be more prevalent due to our weather? Maybe uh, weather pattern. <laughs> it's kind of difficult uh, to make any kind of prediction like that, but. Uh, as I said, you know, like the infection starts from the lower limbs. And unfortunately, I don't find any literature that's saying that why that is the case. So it's my own hypothesis because when it rains, say, okay, you put an infected, say, 100 infected needles underneath a tree and on the ground. So if it's perfectly dry, I can guarantee you nothing gonna happen. But if it is raining and then lots of uh, moisture on the ground, and then obviously that you know moisture will evaporate and and uh, come as a making some kind of uh, after condensation, it will have some kind of water droplet on those needles. Those are touching the infected needles. That's what fungal organism needs. So that's why the infection starts. So in a sense, if it's more rainy, more humid, there may be more disease. Well, thank you, Mafuz. Uh, and You're welcome, it's, Dave. It's about uh, time that we jump Perfect. on and uh, get uh, John Cobb on here. I think he's still here. There he is. Yeah, up on high on the mountain in Ireland, West Virginia, Lewis County, John Cobb is our 2019 Tree Farmer of the Year. And uh, he's done all sorts of great activities in, in association with many different organizations. And uh, he's gonna tell us a little bit about that. John, are you all set? You will have to unmute your mic and share your screen. Audio, how's that? Okay, we hear you. Okay, now I've got to figure out how to get this up. Okay. Um, what do I do? I hit uh, okay, control. Okay, we are not seeing it yet. You sh there should have been a little share screen. Uh, let's see. I have it open. I don't know how to get it up there, though. Um, well, okay, so remember when you share a screen, you select the screen you want to show, and then there's a little blue share button down on the lower right hand side. Well, let's see. I hit the share button first. Uh, okay, yeah. I don't think I, I see what you're saying, but click, I don't. Click on, click on your PowerPoint and then hit that share button. Okay, let's see if I have it. Click on the PowerPoint first. Yeah, when you say share screen, there should be a dialog box with a bunch of squares in it, and you select the one that looks like your PowerPoint, and then click on it, and then hit the share button down on the right-hand side. Okay, there's the seminars. If I can get that to open, I'll just put share. There it is. It's now see company. if I can... Okay, we have it. We see your presentation. You just can click that and open it up, maybe. Hopefully, that'll get there. How's that? I uh, can't see it yet. Can you see it on your screen? I see it on mine. Okay, so do this, John. You go up to that little green arrow again and say share again or share a, another, a new share, I think it is. A new share, okay. And then select that PowerPoint. There it is and then share. There it is. You got it? We got it. Okay, great. Well, first of all, I appreciate all your help, Dave, in helping me get this set up. I'm not very technically oriented. And also, I think you've done a great job. We have 80 some people involved in this online seminar to get their continuing education credits. So it's a great thing. 
I'm interested in uh, sharing the benefits and results that I've received from West Virginia Division of Forestry and also from NRCS, part of U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, I have a stewardship plan thanks to my forester and uh, I'm a certified tree farmer. And so basically I want to get into uh, family forest owners are actively involved in helping wildlife making sure they have quality water on their property, that they have a long-term supply of regenerated timber that they can sell and leave a forest legacy for their families, and then help endangered species along the way like the cerulean warbler, uh, which I have done some work on my property. It's interesting that the most of the nation's forests are owned by families, followed by the government at 30% and corporations at 20%. So individual rural landowners are very active in uh, ownership of forests and we need more of them to be active in working to make sure we have quality conservation in place. According to the research that was done by the American Forest Foundation, wildlife privacy, leaving, leaving their land in a better way for their families and beauty are some of the major goals that landowners uh, pursue. Um, for example, in uh, my area and across West Virginia to become a certified tree farmer and get a managed timberland status, you have to have your social security number, the deed to your property, which you can go to your local farm service agency and get a farm number and a track number. And then you can put your stewardship plan in place, working with a private or a West Virginia forester to create that management plan as long as you have 10 acres or more. And there's a number of different programs you can use to improve your property, EQIP and CSP, Conservation Stewardship Plans, that will actually pay you money to improve your property. Across uh, mm -hmm. West Virginia, there are 14 conservation districts for uh, NRCS, and uh, they're all very active and all very helpful to landowners. And they combine and work very well with West Virginia Division of Forestry uh, and are able to deal with the six districts there. I have been fortunate to have um, my local forester right now is Danny James. And he was here yesterday and has been very helpful to me. If we have 80 plus people here and most of them are foresters, we've got almost every forester in West Virginia attending this online seminar during this coronavirus pandemic that we're dealing with. Um, my specific landowner obligations were identified with my forester at the time, which is Travis Miller. And he was a very wise and, and well-educated forester. And he helped me to create a plan for, at that time I had 324 acres. Now I have 365 acres. And I wanted to have quality wildlife on my property. I wanted good soil, good water. And I have a very mountainous area. I live in here in Lewis County. so. He has helped me in all those regards, and he showed me how to create um, recreation for my family and my grandkids. And I have a number of ATV trails that I have marked off with him and also on my own. But it, recreation is only part of it. ATV riding, hunting, and hiking are all important to me and my family, but at the same time, these trails are work trails and they allow me to access the 12 or now 14 different stands that I have identified in my management plan 
uh, to access those and to be able to take my equipment in and to take care of those. And in addition to recreation and work, fire prevention is one of the reasons for having my trails and all of my trails are wide enough to handle, um, you know, fire uh, personnel and fire vehicles to put out any fires that would occur on my property. And as we all know, this time of year is a very difficult time for potentials for fires to start up. My home is elevated at 1725. I've got now four natural waterfalls on my property, which make it really great from a static point of view. And I really have done a lot with opening up a new field that I created. And that has allowed me to expand the wildlife on my property. Here are eight of the stands in a chart that is in my management plan. And the clear cut is um, one thing I did out below my house that was for aesthetics and also for wildlife and stand two Recently, I had a very, very large quantity of American holly in a 20 acre section and my management plan identified that early on when Travis Miller and I put it together. But most recently and actually yesterday, because of the rain was coming in today, I had my forester um, Danny James come out and we inspected the completion of two programs that I had in place. One of them was the American Holly and the other one was treating the um, autumn olive that I have on a two acre stand. So both of those were completed and signed off on yesterday and I will receive my payment for those completed projects in October of this year from NRCS by direct deposit to my bank account. It's a very clean and effective process and the best part of it is getting paid to improve your property and I can't thank West Virginia Forestry and NRCS for the work that they've done to help me achieve the goals on my property and have a more valuable property. As I just mentioned on 20 acres, I cut the uh, American holly and removed it. And as um, Danny James said yesterday, your poplars, oaks, and red oaks and white oaks are going to be so happy that you've taken this all out. And he says it's the woods and the forest is absolutely beautiful now. So part of that 20 acres was a two-fold equip contract. One was to cut the grapevines there, which I did first. And then I went back through and cut the holly trees. And as you know, grapevines are a source of water. And you can see the water dripping there. And, you know, if you're ever lost in the woods and you need, let's see if I can get this to go to next here. I don't know where that is. There we go. So it's important when you're working your property on equip programs to make sure you have the right equipment. I have a good side by side. I have cloppers, I have weed eaters, I have weed eater with a saw blade on it. I have actually owned 10 different chainsaws. The most effective one I find for cutting holly and grapevines is the steel MS193T. It is what the tree climbers use when they're cutting limbs off trees before felling the whole tree. And it's lightweight, you can hold it in one hand. I always take gas with me. Uh, I fill up water bottles with gas. I have oil, I have water, I have gloves, I have a headband because I sweat a lot. I have ear and eye protection, a backpack to carry everything and it's important to have the right equipment when you're in the woods because when I'm in the woods cutting, I'll carry that chainsaw running sometime for seven hours a day. Here's a picture of that was the 192. I have two of these now. I just bought another one and they're great for cutting the, uh, the holly trees. If I can get this thing, there we go. 
here's uh, Danny James on, on the left over here. He's GPSing the start of my 20 acre holly cut. Here's the field that I created after I did a clear cut, which I'll get into here in a few minutes. But make mo no mistake, this is very detailed here. Danny has gone in and in this particular area, he is marking a cut for a uh, future cut for holly and for autumn olive. He is ranking the density of that. So for example, on a five acre plot, I will receive payment for 3.4 acres because the density was not 100% on the five acres. And so it's all very calculated and very precise, and it's very effective for a landowner. Um, I think the first presentation today had one of these pictures that I have. This is Samaris who just went to Kansas. Tom Wilson Croft, who's now involved in pollinating, and that's me, the landowner, signing up another NRCS contract. The good thing about working with forestry and NRCS, they will mark map and show on your property in addition to a description of what you need to do it'll lay out an equip this was going back to uh, 2010 and it shows the county and the grapevine removal that i was involved in back then um, there's a number of different ways you can work but the equip is effective for thinning uh, your forest for crop tree release for culling trees that uh, need to be taken out, and like the American holly, autumn olive, multiflora rose. I was cutting tree of heaven and sumac yesterday in my woods uh, before Danny came up to do the survey of my two completed projects. Uh, I wish Japanese silkgrass was included in uh, invasive species payout I have purchased a, uh, uh, a backpack sprayer that is battery operated that I'll be using on the Japanese silkgrass this year and I'm uh, very frustrated that I have it but after doing my clear cut uh, that's just part of the game and unless you're a state forest manager and you can have the loggers spray their equipment before they come in and cut. This is an example of a number of the different projects that I've done. And this is grapevine removal in a couple areas. And then I did um, some hand sculpting. This is a small area right here where I created a new one acre field that I have planted trees around. These two areas here that are in kind of tan, those are back cuts I did for wildlife so it's easier for wildlife to bring their young into a field without being attacked by predators so it's an open area that they can be protected in. Of course the grapevine removal is extremely important. Here's autumn olive here, autumn olive here, and autumn olive in these two fields and this field down on my other new property here across Green Hill Road. Um, part of the planting that I did when I planted uh, 58 trees around my acre field, I received $648.06 for planting that acre and I also received funds for the three tons of lime, the one ton of fertilizer that I put down and then I put bird's foot trifoil uh, orchard grass, Kentucky fescue 31, and three different kinds of clover. And I was paid to do that. I didn't pay for all of my expenses, but it sure didn't hurt in that regard. And then I received payments for cutting invasive species, mollyflora rose and autumn olive. I have a neighbor who happened to read one of the articles I've written, and I write articles mainly to give back to forestry and NRCS because of what they've enabled me to do to improve the quality of my land and to, and to pay me to do that. So neighbor who is a retired colonel at 51 years old, he wrote his own stewardship plan. 
He was interested in recreation, future income, and main focus is on wildlife. He's done a great job. Um, he has done hinge cuts for wildlife on his property. He manages and quantifies and the, the quality and amount of wild turkey and grouse and deer on his property using cameras in strategic lo locations and takes a tally of those. He has improved, he's done a cerulean cut, which also improves the um, topography of your land for when you do a select cut for the cerulean warbler, it helps rough grouse and wild turkey by creating gaps in the canopy, which let more light in and create a more growth of shrubs and plants that make it safe for the young cerulean warblers when they drop out of their nests. So it's interesting that he wrote that plan. He had it accepted by NRCS. He had it in, he did the projects that he identified in his, his uh, management plan. And he subsequently was paid by NRCS for those completions. And then he filed and obtained a managed timberland status and got his taxes lowered on his property by writing his own stewardship plan. So, you know, it's an important thing to let landowners know that they can get involved and they can fix up their new property or their, their, their forest land. Here's, if you see these trees here, if my cursor, is my cursor moving there, Dave? Okay, can you, okay, good. Well, these trees here were actually up right along here, but when I did my 10 acre clear cut out here in front of my house, I also did this one acre clear cut where I created a field. I had the stumps removed and shoved off into the woods. And again, I put three tons of lime and I put a ton, actually I put more than three quarters, but I put a ton of fertilizer down and that was stage one. Here's what it looks like today. I've planted 58 black walnut trees around this field. I have, this is where I have all my clover and my bird's foot trifoil. And it's enabled me to have a whole new aesthetics to my property and my view. I had a view that was choked in by nothing but forest. And now thanks to forestry and RCS, I have this new vista to enjoy for the next 10 or more years. In uh, 2018, I was paid $11,564.73 for doing six different projects that were grant taxable payments from NRCS, US Department of Agriculture. So it is effective, the landowners can get money for it. When I did my clear cut, I received $38,743 from the timber sales and NRCS kindly paid me $7,906 to do a clear cut for wildlife. Rather than take that money and spend it on something frivolous, I decided to keep it on the land and give back. And I built a 30 by 40 barn there I used West Virginia labor to put it in place. And it was a win-win for me as a landowner. And it helped me keep my managed timberland status, which I apply for each year and put down the number of acres. And now it is a total of 365 acres with recent purchases. So one of the things we've done in the tree car Farm Committee that uh, Dave is the chair of, Dave McGill is the chair of, uh, we have identified the benefits of the tree farm program to landowners and really it's education and working with forestry professionals um, and plus networking with a lot of different organizations that help you get information and data that you can use to make your property more valuable. So what do I do? Every year I give back 
by writing articles in local newspapers. This was in the Braxton Citizen News, and this one was in uh, another local newspaper. Here I had a tour of my property, and um, you know, here's Tyler Prezula and Tom Wilsoncroft and uh, Barbara Bischoff. And we just had a lot of people come and see what I've done and what I've accomplished. Here's the Braxton Democrat. And again, here's Kyle Aldlinger, and uh, these are this is a landowner and a landowner here. And they only had 23.6 acres each, but they can put in a 10 acre combined between the two properties, a 10 acre select cut for the Cerulean Warbler, and I advertise that. This is Dave. This is Jim Mitchell, uh, chair and co-chair. This is myself. This is Kyle and Rudy and a number of other people. And we meet and we have worked this year to try to increase the number of certified tree farms in West Virginia. It, when we started out, it's pretty sad when you think about it, 70 some percent of West Virginia is forest land. And we only have 147 certified tree farms in West Virginia, and that includes the three that we've just gotten this year. And we need to get more work done by forestry and NRCS to educate landowners, and I hope there are some landowners listening into this, to be able to get their property certified, get a farm number, a track number, and get a management plan in place and get their property tree farm certified so they can take advantage of some of these programs. Personally, from my standpoint, this is what I think is important to take away from this discussion today. And that is what is the value of the tree farm program to an individual landowner in West Virginia or anywhere across America? And these are personal and they're somewhat income related, but mainly personal. And I'm going to put this slide up again at the end because I think it's important that NRCS and forestry, who are basically very educated, very knowledgeable people, but they're not salespeople. And they do not talk about the benefits that a landowner can get with regard to income and improvement of their property. And I think we all need to be better salespeople when we're talking to new potential tree farmers and new potential landowners to get management plans. What it does is improves your property's value. It gives you a new perspective and person as and perspective and purpose as an individual. It helps wildlife, improves water quality, lots of recreation and enjoyment, fire protection, ability to work on your property. It lets you develop new skills that you never had before. I was a, a uh, I s only wood I dealt with was a 40 foot long mahogany conference table at CBS in New York City. And now I got 365 acres of woods. It's a whole new set of skills that I've learned thanks to forestry thanks to NRCS, and I cannot be thankful enough. It makes you feel involved, it certainly does that. It gives you a chance to give back. It creates a quality inheritance for your family. That's really important to a lot of people because the average forest owner in West Virginia is over 65 years old. It makes you feel good and positive. It keeps you healthy. It makes your retirement more meaningful and it's all about conservation. Now, what can a guy that used to work in New York City do? He can plant 258 trees on his property, but then when one of the trees he left in the middle of his clear cut to drop seeds, a black cherry tree dies, he has to fell that tree. And I'm going to show you what happens when I cut this tree. My grandson, I'm right here at the base of the tree. My grandson was way up in the hill because he thought it was going to fall on him. 
and I felled this tree so it didn't hit any of my tree plantings. And when it falls, you watch, it'll hit the hinge. It'll just stagger for a minute and then it'll go all the way. There it goes. Didn't touch one of them. It was perfect drop. So I never knew that there was such a thing as a tree farmer of the year award. And all of a sudden I was contacted by my forester. He said, you, you know, I'm going to put you in for tree farmer of the year. I said, what's that? So anyway, I ended up going down to Washington. Here's Mike Romano, my West Virginia Senator, Travis Miller, Dave McGill were all there. I took advantage of that and wrote up articles in seven newspapers across West Virginia to help NRCS and forestry get more people to sign up. And Tyler Brazula said that article in the, the, the uh, Braxton newspaper generated a lot of activity. I go to Washington, I meet with our senators, I meet with our congressmen. Uh, Mr. Cobb is a proud landowner from Ireland who has dedicated his time and advocacy for forest conservation and better environment for our state. This is uh, a um, two minute TV video that was put together by the West Virginia Division of Natural Resources. And NRCS. I'm not gonna play the whole two minutes. At first, it may not make much sense it's an early warbler, a bird that hasn't been doing too well recently, actually needs some trees to be cut down. That's why the National Wild Turkey Federation, our West Virginia DNR, and even private landowners, to name a few, are joining forces to try to make this bird thrive again. The School and Warbler Project runs spring 2020. The following segment is Okay, I, I didn't want to play that whole thing for you because my time's running out, but I want landowners that are listening or forestry people are listening. I personally do all this work on my land. I planted 150 trees in tubes on my clear cut at one end of my clear cut and I did that in three days and so all it takes is a little initiative to get out and make it happen, but it has certainly given my forest the diversity that that clear cut has created. I have all kinds of wildlife. My waterfall loves it. <laughs> and uh, the black rat snakes love it. They're always looking for something to eat in the spring. Uh, let's see if I can get there we go. That's it. Um, I want to thank all the foresters listening and any NRCS personnel listening to this and any landowners that you can improve your property and get paid for it. And when I went to Washington one time and met with the head of NRCS, I went down with the Appalachian Mountains Joint Venture and the head of NRCS in Washington at that time said, unfortunately, America's best kept secret is NRCS. We need more landowners to be aware of the fact that they can improve the quality of their land and get paid to do it. So I, my thanks to all of you for that. Great, uh, great talk there, uh, John. Uh, it's uh, you've done so much out there, and uh, uh, always inspiring to hear about uh, you, you sharing that message about you know getting to other landowners and telling them the opportunities that they have. Right. To take. Yeah. Hey, so uh, so it, it, there were a couple comments here, and uh, let's see here. Let me get back to my chat. I think Barb Breshik said something kind of interesting about. You know, you you can always have a logger clean your equipment before bringing it onto your land, but that has to go into the contract, right? So uh, 
and and we always talk to landowners about every every little detail you have in the contract probably scrapes off a little value possibly if there are restrictions but but that's really one that would really go a long way in trying to you know stop the spread of some of this stuff yes it would i agree yeah, yeah the um so uh, there's no other questions there but uh we're kind of waiting for Ben. Ben, ben Spong is our next speaker, and uh, we'll stay on there, John. And uh, his internet went out. You know, we oh just had, we just had this little storm front come through Morgantown. I thought, oh gosh, you know, the power's going to go off, and we have to get everyone back on and stuff. So, but uh, but he his is out. But uh, he just went. Uh, he's he's trying to get back in, and for some reason he can't. So if you just be patient, we'll uh, we'll hear from Ben in a little bit. If not, I'll give one of my quick talks, and uh, you know the to capture the, uh, the the credits, but he should be able to get back in here pretty quick. Great. So, uh, so, so what's new up on the mountain today? Well, I, you know, I'm, I've got um, three other NRCS projects that I have to go through. I've got uh, uh, Brandon Duckworth from Weston coming out on May 1st to also give me one on pollinating. I'm going to get involved with that and uh, that's going to be in one of the fields where I've done a back cut. And also I have to eliminate uh, in 2020 and 2021 um, the autumn olive. I'll say one thing about the forestry and NRCS programs. The initial program I had on those three fields was to control autumn olive and control is not eradicating it. And it took me five years of cutting that to, in the third year I realized that, you know, this is not getting rid of it. And then they made it clear to me that that contract was for control. Well, I told them, I won't think you should ever sign another landowner up for control because it doesn't get rid of it and it's just a make work project. But I completed the five years, and now I am working with a chainsaw, a weed eater with a saw blade, and I will be uh, spraying every one of those I cut. But when I showed Danny James, my forestry yesterday, that field, he says, I can't believe that. I came here for one of your forestry tours three years ago, and there wasn't one autumn olive. And look at it. The whole field is full of it. And what I need to do is take before and after pictures. I'll do that of the holly because he was so amazed yesterday when we went through and I'll take what it looks like after five years of control with nothing but autumn olive in the whole field. Jeez, awful. Hey, well, Glenn Jurgens just sent a question. Uh, do, you, sure. uh, do you use any herbicide to control the autumn olive? Say that again. Do you use any herbicide to control the autumn olive? I do now, yes. On the But the, the first contract I had, I couldn't use herbicide. It was only a control contract. And I I would not recommend anyone get a control contract if they because you're just cutting it and it comes right back. In some cases, you cut one autumn olive and the roots spread out and five or 10 or 20 come up from that one that you cut. So it's... Uh, Control is not good. Eradication is the best. So yes, I will be spraying, and I have been spraying the the one field that I just finished. Well, how do you treat that? What kind of herbicide is it? Do you cut then cut the, treat the stump, or do you spray foliage? You only treat the stump, and you treat it with uh, glycinate, which is like a heavy Roundup product, along with diesel fuel and the diesel fuel holds it to the stump, and this time of year is the best time to do it. It really doesn't do any good to cut it and treat it in the dead of winter. You want it sucking, the roots sucking in the, uh, herb, you know, the spray. How about what's the, what's the strangest creature you've seen out there? Strangest creature? <laughs> it's kind of isolated out there in Ireland, you know. Yeah, well, if I want a loaf of bread, it's 64 miles round trip. It is really nice. But, but you know, I've, I've seen a lot of different species that I've studied all my life. You know, I, uh, I, I enjoy this work because I worked in um, Yellowstone National Park for the Interior Department when I was 17 and 18. 
uh, killing gooseberry bushes to stop the white pine blister rust. And I learned how to make sure I don't miss many holly trees or autumn olives. Did he come online yet? He is not on the online yet. Okay. And uh, I think so, uh, is that him? Okay, so uh, hang on a sec. Uh, I do not see him. He says he's waiting for host, but uh, he is not. He is not here. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah so. I think the strangest people, the strangest critter I've seen on my property is uh, a bunch of my neighbors picking my morel mushrooms when I didn't know they were in there. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. We just reviewed the regional tree farmer of the year. Uh, applications and we picked uh, the people from Virginia but several people commented that they liked the option of allowing the public to access their property by the tree farmer from Maine and if you notice however the Forest Foundation study showed that the number two goal of forest owners is privacy and so it's kind of ironic that, uh, you know, the guy from Maine and his family were open and had their property open, no fences, and allowed people to come in. They even marked their trails for people to get educated when they walk through the property, which in many ways is good. Uh, in some parts of West Virginia, I'd be pretty careful about that. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, I am not able to get Ben on, so maybe I'll just go and uh, give you a little briefing on uh, something I was developing for um, some of our uh, master gardener group. And it was, it's kind of a, I hate to do this because he's right there with me on the phone, but we're kind of uh, running uh, uh, late on time. So um, uh, let's see here. Uh, so this is... Uh, uh, I've been asked to, and let's see if I'm coming through here. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to, I was developing this for uh, some of our uh, uh, master gardeners. They'd asked me to talk about native shrubs, and this is just one of them. And, and I uh, was kind of going to give them a briefing on some basic botany. But uh, one of the coolest types of shrubs are, are found in the sumac uh, group or genus. And uh, sumacs are in the uh, are in this family called Anacardiaceae, which is the cashew family. And and as uh, some of you may know, um, uh, the the cashews uh, can be actually uh, have a, a pretty strong reaction if you touch them, and uh, uh, and they are also related to poison ivy, which has that oily erucial. And I've talked in some safety meetings about poison ivy and things like that. But but some of the other familiar plants in the in this family are. Poison ivy, sumac, pistachio, uh, cashew, mango, and even the smoke tree, cotinus, if you remember that. I remember Bob Raspiner used to be our assistant state forester, and he nominated the smoke tree out in his yard as the champion of West Virginia. And it went through, I don't know if it's still there, but you know, the genus that sumacs are found in is, is called Roos, and there's about 35 species, it used to be a larger genus, so about 250 until. Uh, Kind of recently, they've taken some of those and, and put them into the genus called Searsia, which is, you know, the taxonomists are always at work, you know, making us learn new new names for these plants. So uh, that's what happened anyway, but uh, it used to be a bigger genus. And they typically have uh, high in tannins. Some of their fruits are used to make spices or little drinks. Uh, they, uh, they use it in different kinds of beers. If you're a brewer, uh, you may be familiar with some of these. And... Um, Anyway, pretty cool plant, and um, and here here it is. You've all seen this. Uh, this is the staghorn sumac, and it's classified as a as a small tree or a shrub, and it's basically it's actually a dioecious plant, meaning on some trees or on some plants uh, you have female flowers, and on other plants you have the male flowers. So the male and female flowers occur on separate plants. That's called dioecious, a state of dioecious. Yes. And so uh, they grow in female or male clones. And, and these clones 
basically, when you see a group of these things, they're all the same genetic individual usually. And uh, so we call that a genet. And then the little shoots that come up from that, those uh, we call ramets. Generally, these are intolerance of shade. So they need you find them out in the bright sunlight, often along roads and other disturbed areas. You know, this, uh, this plant has a, uh, a, a compound leaf. You know, we're looking at a picture of the, the full leaf and, and a compound leaf is made up of, uh, of leaflets. The little green uh, uh, blades are, are actually called leaflets. And like every leaf, uh, this has a petiole or a little stalk. But on compound leaves, especially this pinnately compound leaf, uh, it has a part of the stem going up there. That's called the rachis. And on the rachis are attached the, uh, the leaflets. In a normal simple leaf, that would be kind of the central vein going up through there. But this is a compound leaf it's made from, you know, anywhere from 11 to 31 leaflets. The specimen here has, I think, 18. So kind of cool. And it looks very much like walnut uh, and kind of similar to Tree of Heaven. So when you're talking to people who may be doing a control project, trying to guide them not to kill your sumacs, but to kill Tree of Heaven, one of the main diagnostic features when the leaves are on is that the leaflets on this sumac have little serrations or, or sawtooth edge around the leaf. So that's one way to tell the difference between a uh, tree of heaven, because the tree of heaven has a smooth uh, margin or edge of the leaf around its leaflets. Uh, again, it's a small tree or shrub. The, tri the twigs are very stout, very much like tree of heaven. But in this species, Rus typhon or staghorn sumac, the, uh, the, the twigs are very, very hairy. And in fact, uh, Linnaeus, the guy who uh, developed the, the binomial name, for, scientific name for all these things, uh, he, he described it by Ramus Hirtus Uti Typhini, Typhi Servini. That's my best I can do on the Latin, and meaning the branches are rough like antlers in velvet. So really, staghorn sumac uh, is, is named because its twigs do look like uh, antlers. Uh, here is a kind of interesting thing. You know, when you look at the leaf scar uh, and uh, the lateral bud, the leaf scar uh, goes all the way around the lateral bud. So here's a bud. It's a, it's an embryonic shoot. If that were to you know, start growing, it would grow into another branch. But this is where the leaf sat. And so the leaves in this species uh, sits right on top of that lateral bud. In most species, it doesn't. Most species, you can see the lateral buds when you're looking at, uh, at, at leaves. Uh, and, um, but this one, along with only a couple others, like the sycamore, uh, have its leaves sitting right on top of that lateral bud. Of course, down here are the little vascular bundles in the leaf scar. These are the uh, places where the little tubes came out of the stem and went into the leaf. Uh, when you dissect one of these things longitudinally, um, here is that bud, again, the lateral bud, and this is the leaf scar around here. Here's the inside of the stem. This is the phloem. Uh, this, is the trans this is the vascular tissue that transports the sugars down from the crown into the rest of the tree. Here's the xylem, the wood tissue that uh, conducts the water upward, right? So you can see these things and you can see where these, these traces of the, vas of the xylem and phloem come out here and once went into the leaf at the leaf scar. And, and, and now they're going into this bud. So if this bud starts developing, that will grow into a whole new sheet, uh, shoot system. Um, pretty unique uh, plant. This has this pyra pyramidal inflorescence, of, often called a bob, <laughs> and uh, and uh, they're they're covered with uh, red uh, red and velvety uh, spreading hairs. Here's the flower, kind of pretty little thing. Uh, this is a male flower. Remember, this is a dioecious plant where the male flowers are on one uh, tree or shrub, and the females are on the other. You can see the functional stamens full of pollen, right? They, male uh, flower flowers produce the pollen. And down in here is the pistillate part of the flower, very much underdeveloped. It's not receptive. It's not going to develop into a fruit. This is the male flower. Here's the pistillate flower. You can see it's almost the opposite. And on the center part of this, you can see a functional uh, pistil. This is the stigma, the outer part that's receptive to catches the pollen. And uh, if you look closely, these are tiny little uh, stamens, the things that produce the pollen very much underdeveloped. This is a female flower, not the male. The male, male flowers down here. So, so kind of different. 
kind of an interesting thing. Here's an up close and personal to, to the flower. You can see that the stamens coming up with these anthers full of pollen, little, um, supported on these little filaments, um, the sepals on the outside, and the pedicel, the little stalk of the, of the flower. Um, there's all sorts of different types of flower inflorescences. The one we're most interested in, you know, there's all the simple ones up here, but you have to get way down here to this compound inflorescence in the lower right hand corner. It's called a panicle, which is actually a multi branched type of uh, inflorescence or, or flower structure, pretty complex. Here it is uh, in the summer, just before it, to, or kind of as it's starting to flower. Uh, it, the peduncle is the structure that the inflorescence is you know, standing on, basically. And then there's a primary rachis. We heard that term when we we're talking about the compound leaf holding the leaflets. Well, the flower structures also have a rachis. This is the primary rachis. Here's a secondary one coming out here. So primary, secondary, and the fact that it has two rachises uh, actually helps define the fact that this is a panicle type of inflorescence. Uh, here, here we get up close, we can again see this secondary rachis, the, the second one, and then the little pedicels that the individual flowers are on. Right now, only these are only in flower bud form, so uh, can't really uh, see them too well. And uh, the, there's the rachis again, uh, did I, is, that looks like the same one, I don't know what the point was here, but here's a little flower coming out. Uh, these, again, are, they come up in clones, like I was talking about. We have the genets and the little ramet shoots coming up. This is not a, this is not a sumac, but this is a tree of heaven. We were doing some control work out on the interstate years ago and it got this picture. So this parents, here's the parents, and you can see the root coming over. These, these uh, interstate uh, sites are very much disturbed, uh, lots of uh, soil movement, but here's one ramet or sucker, we call them, coming up from the root. And over here is another one. You can follow that route back to the parent stem. Kind of cool uh, to see that sometimes. Uh, but sumac does the same. And here's a little one came off a rail trail. Here's the sucker or the or the shoot or ramet. And here is the root. Uh, probably connected it to the this one. Probably connected it to the parent stem. And here's a little picture of what these clones look like. Right? They they're all the same genet. They're all the same genetic individual, but just all sorts of different shoots. You could tell out here, probably the farmer was like uh, brush hogging this, the edge of it. And so uh, generally the ones on the outside are the younger, the younger stems. Um, a kind of a back to the lesson of these fluid conducting tissues we have, um, right? The, the red represents the phloem conducting the sugar solution down from the leaves. The blue represents the, uh, water, the fluids, uh, the water and nutrients coming up from the roots into these different uh, elements. and. Uh, and uh, we can see the same thing in the trunks of the tree. So, so this is not a sumac, but and a sumac doesn't probably get this big. But uh, uh, you have all these different. You have the outer bark, and then this inner bark. This this uh, is the uh, phloem, and then this very thin vascular cambium tissue that divides, and it, it's a meristematic tissue. It uh, um, uh, and then on the inside is the xylem or the wood tissue. And so the meristem as it grows. Uh, if the, these are all made up of the, about the same side type of uh, cell, and, but if those cells migrate to the outside, they differentiate into phloem tissue, and if they migrate to the inside, they differentiate into xylem tissue, kind of a remarkable type of tissue, meristematic tissue. Uh, and, uh, oh, we have these little arrows, okay, la, la, la. And the whole point of that is uh, to, to, to remember that the, the meristematic tissue is in this stem, and uh, on, on the surface of these sumacs, uh, have, we have these fairly prominent corky lenticels. And lenticels are the structures that allow gas exchange into and out of the stem. And the reason it does that is because you have this meristematic tissue inside that's growing, it needs oxygen. And so this is how the, the plants get their oxygen uh, into and out of the stem and kind of release the carbon dioxide back out of the stem. A uh, pretty cool plant as well, because uh, not only does it have the xylem and phloem as vascular tissue, it has these things called Latissifers, which conduct the, this latex, and, you, and you've seen this latex in different types of plants. Even uh, Norway maple has it. If you break open a little twig or cut off a, a limb, you'll see, or a, 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 a little petiole stem of the leaf, you'll see this latex. This is a this is a, produces a secondary metabolite, really trying to dissuade things from eating you. <laughs> or, or it tries to dissuade uh, browsers from from gobbling uh, the leaves down. 
So kind of cool there. Uh, here's the pyramidal bob or this very furry uh, structure of the, um, of, the, uh, of the fruit of the panicle all ripe. And uh, when we take a close look, uh, this is one single seed over on the left there. It's a staghorn sumac seed full of hair pulled that off the now if you bite into this i'm not recommending it because uh, sometimes uh it can be a little bit irritating um it, it has a real real tart uh, tart taste people make juices out of here very kind of uh sour taste and um it's high in maleic acid which is a, it kind of tastes like it has ascorbic acid in vitamin c but it doesn't and then over on the right you can see that this yeah, on the inside has these little hard shells and so this technically is called the fruit type or the, yeah, the fruit type is called a droop which is uh a one of the, like one of the stone fruits like the cherry the peach the, the almond that have the hard shell inside not the almond uh oh yeah that is an almond excuse me uh almond uh those stone fruits um uh this is one of them staghorn sumac and so you can see if you if you bite on this thing you're probably not going to break it uh very easily pretty pretty tough durable little uh, endocarp that is on the inside. Here's its distribution and uh, kind of pretty widespread distribution, uh, uh, not quite going up very far into Canada and kind of staying at the higher elevations the, the farther south it goes. Pretty interesting though. It has a close cousin, the smooth sumac or Rus glabra. Glabra, anytime you hear that, it suggests some kind of smooth or hairless condition. This also is pinnately compound, about the same number of leaflets, 11 to 31, serrate to margin, all, everything's different, except the petioles, the little stems are glabrous and they're not hairy. You look at, the, look at this smooth stem. Now, if you were to take your finger and rub it along that stem, that white stuff would come off and underneath you would see some very reddish colored uh, uh, petioles or, or the leaf stems there and very bright green uh, twig, but there's, this is very hairless. Uh, Rus glabra. Uh, here it is, another view. It looks almost identical to a staghorn sumac, except it's very, not very hairy. Um, here's here are the fruits. Now, it, it's uh, pretty easy to tell this one from the others because from the other um, because it doesn't have as much hair. There's a little bit of hair, but not so much. You can actually see the individual seeds in that inflorescence. This one has a little bit different um, distribution. It's scattered throughout the West a little bit in, in uh, some of the, maybe the more moist places. I'm not quite sure exactly where that goes, but it also extends much farther south and out to the West than Staghorn Sumac. One other one that we see here in the state, it's always uh, very nice to see, especially in the fall, is the winged or the shining or the flame leaf sumac, it's called. Oh, those are the common names for Rus copalinum. And uh, this generally flowers in August and, and uh, you know, following the others. It's a, kind of the late flowering plant. Uh, it just has the most beautiful foliage, maroon. All, really, all of the sumacs have a beautiful uh, foliage, but uh, this one in particular is very, very, very deep maroon. Um, here's this distribution, again, fairly widely distributed, maybe gets up into Canada a little farther than uh, Staghorn Sumac and, and certainly gets way down, all the way down into all of the counties of Florida. So uh, this one may like uh, the sun a little bit more than, the you know, sun and the heat a little bit more than the Staghorn. So, so uh, that's about it. Just a real quick uh, botany briefing to fill the time in here. Uh, sorry, we could get Ben back on. I can't believe uh, that happened, but I still don't see him. I've sent him a couple uh, um, things, go, things. So um, and anyway, uh, that's basically it for our meeting. And, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, um, Oh, there's another. One. So, uh, so as uh, as I was talking there, we had another uh, comment come in about landers need to be careful applying herbicide in the spring as the rising sap will wash out the herbicide. Right? Yes, and that's particularly true when you're doing um, uh, stem injections of some kind, like hack and squirt, or if you have some other injector that you're using for the stems of these of these weeds. Um, so, um, so that's all I have and uh, appreciate all the speakers. And uh, again, apologize for not uh, being able to get Ben back on here. But uh, so for those of you um, who have, uh, who are wanting to get continuing forestry education credits, 
um, just send me an email with your RPF number or your CFE or your SAF number, and then I'll combine those with the um, with the uh, attendance record and uh, and send those in. So uh, you know Matt Aberley uh, and uh, Chelsea. Chelsea's not here, but uh, Mafuz and and uh, John appreciate your contribution to this. And uh, we're going to be on tomorrow again. I don't know if anyone else is going to be here, but uh, hopefully. Uh, uh, we can uh, we can not have someone uh, disappear like that next time. So uh, send me any questions you might have. But but if uh, there's no other questions now, oh, there's Phil. Okay, so Phil does have one, and um, and it is. Uh, are there are any of those sumacs poisonous like poison ivy? Uh, no, uh, not like poison ivy. Um, they are in the same family, uh, but. Um, um, at least the berries. Well, the only thing I've heard is that the, the hair on the, the, the fruit uh, can cause irritation, but people make, you know, uh, drinks out of it. They fry the, the flowers on some of those sumacs. So uh, it's nothing like, uh, nothing like the toxicity that, uh, that causes the dermatitis from poison ivy. Um, here's, a, here's a question. What's the best link for information regarding West Virginia Tree Farm Program? Uh, well, if you uh, call your state, if your state foresters are all pretty much in the know about um, the tree farm program. Most of them have uh, been trained as inspectors. If not, uh, you can contact me and I'll put you in touch with uh, a local inspector or your local forester, you know, or if uh, there's a forester there that wants to re uh, reach out and uh, contact you now, they can send you a quick message before we log off. Um, these, these are being uh, archived and I can send anyone who wants this uh, a recording of this session uh, the link and uh, be happy to do that. Just uh, shoot me an email and I'll, I'll send it off to you. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll be signing off and maybe we'll see uh, some of you tomorrow. Thanks again to everyone involved and uh, you all have a nice uh, afternoon and evening.